Great, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Perillo. I'd like to call the select board meeting to order on Monday. You need to mute your phone there. Yeah, April 24, 2023 at 7 p.m. I'm joined by Vice Chair Roy Epstein. Good evening, Roy. Good evening, everybody. Member uh, Elizabeth Young. Good evening. Good evening, Elizabeth. And Town Administrator Trace Carver. Good evening. Jennifer for joining us. She'll be remote later. Okay. Uh, we have a number of uh, topics here to discuss. Uh, we'll have uh, community announcements. Uh, we have a number of those. Um, comments from town residents and the town administrator's report and action by consent. Uh, we have a number of folks here for the proclamation in honor of the 108th anniversary of the Armenian genocide. Uh, at 7.15 uh, or so, uh, or, long, or later, we we'll have a discussion <laughs> on the traffic working group, middle and high school student parking issues. Is that just you reporting out on that? Just, just me. Okay. We did have something, a public hearing that's been um, 7.30 p.m. that has been, um, I guess, deferred to a later meeting. That's right. An art specialties LLC, so that's been crossed off on the agenda. Uh, and then we have uh, Tom Caputo who's here to give us an update on the Belmont Skating Week Building Committee. I don't know if Mark's joining this as well. Mark is joining. Okay, great, thanks, Tom. Uh, discussion and possible vote. Now we're going to go through segment eight articles. Uh, we'll have a number of citizens' petitions. Um, will G be joining us on the sidewalk safety matter? Um, I believe so. Okay. Uh, amend the general bylaw fee for a special event for <coughs> park sites. I think that's Thomasina Olson. Then uh, members of the energy committee, not the energy committee. There are two citizens petition on a 10 year tennis terms for town leases and replace general bylaws with specialized energy. We have some discussion on that one, of course. Discussion possible vote on one time increase in COLA. Uh, we did get information from the chair of the retirement board today, Tom Gibson, but I think Floyd Carmen will be joining us on that matter, either remotely or in person. We're on 830 and uh, then we have a number one day liquor license to approve. And uh, I think fin finalizing with a Vision 21 implementation committee cha charge and discussion on future zoning proposals. Is that, is that just you, Elizabeth, or are we, anyone from that going to be here too? Uh, I think that both Paul Joy and. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah. And then we have a number of minutes. So, well, best agenda, of course. So that will start with um, community announcements. Pass the seal sign. Okay, Hal, why don't you join us? Uh, so there is going to be Belmont Local News. Belmont needs a newspaper. And I'm going to ask uh, Hal Schubin to talk about what this is all about. Good evening, Hal. Please identify yourself. My name is Hal Schubin. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Belmont Voice. It's the first time I've said that. Okay, cool. That's nice. Um, so as you know, the Belmont Citizen Herald no longer covers any news in Belmont. Same in many towns around. So a group of us got together and um, we're putting together a nonprofit professional newspaper. We'll be hiring an editor and some journalists and some freelancers uh, from within the town. We're calling it the Belmont Voice because we want there to be communication uh, between the newspaper in the town, among people in the town, from the town to the newspaper. And it looks like we can uh, publish in print and send it to every household and business in town for free. That's what they do in Concord. Advertising supports it. At least that's the plan so far. And we'll have a website and we'll have social media and all the things that you have for a newspaper and all the things we can't even imagine yet. We're not publishing yet. It's going to take a while. We're doing a lot of fundraising to pay for all of the, uh, the staff we're going to hire. But we do have a website, belmontvoice.org, where people can follow our progress. And um, there's a link there to take the survey. We're interested in community feedback. We want to know what people want to read and how they get news now and just comments about what they're interested in. We have a newsletter that we send out when something happens so people can know what's going on. And we're looking for volunteers. We really want this newspaper to include representation from all across the town, all groups in town, because it's, you know, we're not doing this to the town. We want everybody to be involved. And the more representation we have, the better coverage we'll have. So there are links on the website for a survey, for the newsletter, to volunteer. And um, can you, does that scroll down? Can yes. You, great. And there's a link for the survey if you want to go right to it. Um, the survey will be open for another week or so. 
And we're going to have a, a public forum on the 17th of May at the library so we can talk to folks and get questions and tell them about our progress. I think that's great, Hal. I mean, I think we desperately need a, a local newspaper down the Belmont Center since Hal yeah. is not as local as it once was. And uh, look forward to it as it launches. What, what's your thoughts? I mean, is it a weekly paper, a monthly paper? Or? So good question. So we're, uh, you know, everything's in flux right now. We're, but the plan is we'll, we'll print once a week, send it out. Yep. The website <coughs> as things happen. So I'm hoping that we'll have somebody at a select board meeting on Mondays and we'll get stories in the paper on Tuesday or Wednesday, even if it doesn't come out and print till later in the week, because we want it to be as, as uh, up to date as possible. I think I already did the survey. You said it's open still now. Uh, okay. so if anybody hasn't, we'd love to hear uh, from what okay, great. Have to Congratulations and thank you very much for leading that effort and all those involved as well. Yeah, it's a great group. Yeah, thanks for. Thank you. Yeah, really important. This was the first uh, campaign that had no local coverage at all in a paper. It was really, really hard to get information out. So this is such an important public service. Yeah, it's really hard from the voters' point of view. Yeah, and and candidates as well. Right. Well, Hal, I think this is great. But is there an editorial board or an editor who's going to set the? So we have. That's for the public. We have the board of directors, and uh, we have an editorial advisory board. I'm not good at names. I won't try to name everybody, but the website has the list. And there are a number of uh, prominent local journalists who are um, helping out and providing guidance. Um, and we will hire an editor and then we'll develop policies. Because we're going to be, non we're going to be nonprofit, we have to be somewhat nonpartisan. So we won't be endorsing candidates, but we'll be presenting pro and con arguments for uh, for candidates and for issues. Because as Elizabeth was saying, we want people to be informed. So we will be developing all those policies. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Hal. Appreciate Thank you coming in to talk about it. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay, uh, you were invited to attend a warrant briefing Thursday, April 27, 2023, at 7.30 p.m. This is all remote, right? That is correct. I assume um, on my channel 8, uh, channel 28, Verizon. Warrant articles prior to annual town meeting segment A only. Town officials and department heads will be present to provide information. And this will be let the discussion will be moderated uh, by the chair of the Warrant Committee, uh, Jeff Lubian. And it is, of course, co sponsored by the Warrant Committee and the uh, League of Women Voters here in Belmont. Public forum on water and sewer rates. We've decided uh, to have this forum. It's kind of an odd time, 6 to 7 p.m. on Wednesday, May 10, 2023. Is that before? Is that before some? It says it's the before the fourth night of town meeting. So right. I don't think it's the only time we had night. scheduled. It's gonna be a fourth night? No, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know. Out the God's ears. <laughs> yeah, you never well, know. I'll tell folks to move the question. We can't have a fourth, fourth night. Three nights probably is enough. So this, is this? So it's only from six to seven, right? Unless there is, if there's no town meeting, then we can go past. Go longer. That. I guess we'll know that. All right. Um, it will be remote only. We'll. we'll, we'll We'll be here, though, right? We'll be here, or will the suck board be on? Be on. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm gonna have to find that out. Yeah, you all want to be here for that? Uh, we can do remote. Oh, yeah. Well, for, if there's a town meeting, then it's gonna be difficult for us to do that, right? I think we'd have to be, be at the high school. Yeah, that's yeah, right. So we'd have, so we'd have to, have to be, be flexible unless, and do whatever we unless there's not a sense. town meeting, then perhaps we could. I don't think anyone would show up, though. We can still do it here. Okay. Let me uh, look into it. I'd rather meet here if we can. I hate to post. If there's no town meeting, we can meet there. I suppose if you want to meet through this remotely. I am willing to do whatever. Yeah, okay. Unless there's a it makes town no meeting. sense for town staff. You just have to scoot out of here if there's a town meeting. That's right. Just leave it to someone. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, Patrice. So we look forward to getting input on that. Uh, I thought this was pretty cool. I saw this in my packet. Frank Sinatra tribute performance by Patrick Tobin. I've not heard of this individual. Uh, this is Thursday, April, of course, I've heard about Frank Sinatra. Uh, Thursday, April 25th at 1.15 yeah, p.m. Tuesday, it's a... Oh, Tuesday. Tomorrow, God, yeah, actually. Tuesday. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Wow, okay. Singing professionally since 1996, Patrick Tobin is a premier internationally acclaimed Frank Sinatra tribute artist, personator, and singer, covering songs from all of Sinatra's career eras. Uh, no fan will be, will feel left out as Patrick croons his way. <laughs> oh God! Through the American Songbook, cost is free. I have to tell my mom about that one. But that's tomorrow at one fifteen. Game theory. Um, 
This is pretty cool. Uh, so this is about game theory in World War II with Mark Thompson, Friday, April 28th at 1.15 p.m. On August 19th, 1942, I've heard about this. I've read about this uh, issue. 1,000 Allied servicemen died in a raid on the town of the Dieppe, I guess, on the French coast, which has since been called harebrained, God, and achieved next to nothing. How could many of Britain's best decision makers in the Second World War have concocted this disaster? Well, it's war, right? From 1975 to 1983, Mark Thompson was a full-time professor at Harvard University teaching courses on decision science, game theory, and social program evaluation. He has also been a visiting professor at the Université de Paris and the Université Bielefeld and North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. I need a few more you know, cities I can't pronounce. In this fascinating talk, he would draw on his book, Dis Disputed Decisions of World War II, Decision Science and Game Theory Perspectives. Cost is free at the Beach Street Center. Um, May 5th at 1.15. Thank you. Coronavirus, con coronavirus celebration. Uh, coronation. <laughs> it's just too small for me. God, hang on for a moment. I'm going, who wants to read? You go ahead and read it. Why don't we share duties here? I can't see the type. I can read it. That's why I've got my, my little my tiny glasses. little laptop here. Coronation celebration. Coronavirus. <laughs> We're certainly not celebrating the coronavirus. I guess we can like, celebrate like the end of it. You read it. Please. Okay, I'll read it. Lord. Coronation celebrations. <laughs> The coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, Friday, May 5th at 1.15 p.m. Celebrate Saturday's coronation of King Charles III <laughs> with the 2012 documentary, The Coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, a definitive insider's account of Her Majesty's June 2nd, 1953 coronation. This momentous day united post-war Britain, but was nearly ruined by behind-the-scenes rivalry. Join us for an afternoon showing of the film complete with tea and English snacks. Oh, uh, you do need to call 617 993 2970 to register. The cost is free. And again, at the Beach Street Center, they've got some great programming. Well done. Sunday. Very much. Sunday. May 5th, Saturday, May 5th. Oh. Why don't you announce this one? Or I'm sorry, Friday, May 5th. I said Saturday, but it's Friday. <laughs> Let's have Roy. Thank you for that. I, I couldn't, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't <laughs> read it. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Roy, leaf flow of right, Iowa yeah. is in effect. So <clears throat> people may remember that the town meeting last November approved a new leaf blower bylaw, or, which is in effect. Uh, starting this year, and I wanted to remind people what the main provisions are. Uh, the most important one, and what was re really the genesis of this bylaw, was that during uh, basically the summer months and late spring, early fall, so between May 15th and September 30th, commercial landscapers uh, may not use gasoline powered leaf blowers. Uh, anywhere in town. So they can use them up until May 15th. They can use them ap after September 30th. But during the, this, uh, the period May 15th to September 30th, uh, commercial entities uh, may not use gasoline powered leaf blowers. Uh, homeowners may. So if you're a homeowner and you own a gasoline powered leaf blower, you can use it without any uh, limitation um, so homeowners are exempt from that, although we encourage people to consider buying an electric powered leaf blower and Belmont Light is now offering a $30 rebate on a new unit. Um, the other uh, main things I wanted to call to everybody's attention is that in addition to this prohibition on gasoline units by commercial landscapers during the specified time, there's also a limit on the number of leaf blowers that may be used on a single property. There is a list that's available on the town website on the DPW page. There's a link that has a list. It's every single property in Belmont alphabetized. And you'll see that generally the limit is two, but for larger properties, it goes to three. And for some very large properties, it goes to four. But for the great majority of properties and landscape, the limit is two leaf blowers. Uh, the other thing people should be aware of is that the responsibility for compliance is really on the homeowner. 
So uh, there is a penalty specified in the bylaw, which starts out as a written warning, uh, <clears throat> where the principal violation, I imagine, would be either a landscaper using a gasoline unit in the middle of the summer, uh, or using more than the uh, limit, <clears throat> more than the allowed number of leaf blowers simultaneously. This was all the strike a balance between noise and pollution and getting your yard work done and disturbing your neighbors and so forth. It's all a balancing act. Uh, the primary uh, compliance responsibility is on the homeowner to instruct their landscaper what the rules are. And we're doing our best to, to advertise that between the link on the website. We'll probably put a mailer in the utility bills in the near future. So uh, everybody should know that this is out there. Uh, the initial um, penalty, so to speak, is a written warning. The, we are really striving to get everybody to recognize that this is actually a sensible policy and to comply voluntarily. But if somebody is really a repeat offender, there is a monetary penalty in the bylaw. But we hope not to go there. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, the enforcement mechanism itself uh, will be a town officer who is will be identified in the very near future. It will not be the police department, but there will be a responsible office in the town um, if anybody uh, wants to bring a complaint. And uh, hopefully, though, that this will be self-enforcing so that the need for really a lot of intervention um, will not be necessary. But we'll see, because we are serious about it. Uh, having this bylaw enforced, and uh, uh, hopefully it will lead to an improvement in the overall quality <laughs> of life, at least. That's the hope. Well, thank you for that, Roy. And I think it is important that we folks probably have forgotten about this to some extent in communicating the beginning of this, right, in a couple of weeks here. I think it's important. So it's on our website, plus we're going to do a mailer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you I think we should, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think that's it for announcements. Yep. Um, so other than that, uh, and topics in the agenda, are there any comments from town residents? Yes, sir. Please come up and identify yourself. Not about this, about another topic. Well, something that's not in the agenda, is that correct? Uh, no, it's on the agenda. Okay, why don't you then wait okay. when the agenda topic comes up. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Just one question. You're out, yes. I'm not sure if I remember it correctly. For the leaf blower, did they take into account if if it's electric, <coughs> the landscaper has a gasoline powered unit to plug into? I don't remember if that came up. Yeah, I don't recall. Uh, That's going to make a lot of noise, also. Honestly, we, we did not consider a scenario where somebody is running a gasoline generator on their truck with a very long extension cord attached to an electric leaf blower. We, um, that's probably a loophole at the moment, but uh, we have not observed any any units of that sort either. So, Thank you, Jura. We'll Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? With that, I'll turn over to the town administrator. Patrice? Thank you. Uh, just a couple items. I wanted to uh, inform the board that the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Drinking Water Program um, has named uh, Belmont's Water Department um, an outstanding performance for 2022. This is in recognition of maintenance and update of the town's water system. Um, the town has not received um, this award since 2018. So it's real kudos to the Water Department for Jay Marcotte and uh, Mark Mancuso. So there will be a ceremony on May 11th that uh, members of the staff will be attending. Where's this uh, ceremony, Patrice? At the State House. Oh, wow. So. Hmm. Perhaps we can let me know when that might be. Yeah. End. Sure. Uh, can I just read one sentence here that I highlighted? Your system sure. has achieved one of the top scores in the consecutive system category, the 2023 Public Water Systems Awards Program. So I agree, Patrice. Congratulations to Jay Markai and Mark Mancuso. It's quite an Yeah. It's great. Celebration here. Thank you. And then the second item is this is a letter um, I've attached in your packet. This is a letter that goes out every year at 
before annual town meeting to all the town meeting members. Usually we um, are scrambling to get this out um, and I have the chair um, look at it, but this year we had a meeting. So I wanted to take the opportunity to show the letter to the board and if there's anything you want to add, subtract, edit, just send to me and we can um, we can get it out to town meeting reps this week. I have no comment. No comments. Roy? No, I'll look good. Okay. okay, great, thank you. That concludes my report. Did it? Okay. Um, so I'm honored to again recognize um, um, and read a proclamation in honor of the 108th anniversary of the Armenian genocide. There were a number of events this over the weekend, Friday and Sunday, to, to acknowledge uh, that genocide. And uh, Jahaz Hosepian is here to accept this proclamation. You're going to make a statement as well, and we're going to have a um, Father's going to also say a prayer, is that correct? So let me first read the proclamation. Um, Town of Belmont, Massachusetts, Select Board Proclamation, whereas the month of April commemorates the tragic history of the Armenian genocide of 1915, and whereas April 2023 marks the 108th anniversary of the Armenian genocide, and whereas over one and one half million Armenians were killed and others uprooted from their homeland during this horrific event, and whereas the genocide represents an atrocity against humanity, which we must be continually reminded of, and whereas surviving Armenians have reloc relocated around the world to begin new and productive lives, and whereas a significant and proud population of people with Armenian heritage make their homes here in Belmont, Massachusetts. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the select board of the town of Belmont recalls the Armenian genocide to remind society of this tragic event in the course of years. <coughs> Human events. Select Board Mark Palillo, Chair, Roy Epstein, Vice Chair, Elizabeth Dion, Member. So, Jaha, if you want to come up and accept this, and I know you have a few words that you want to say as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Remember the podium, it might be better to read yeah. your statement there. Yeah. Um, that way you Good evening. Good evening. Select board, Reverend clergy, friends and guests. My name is Gerard Hopsepian. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 4 and a member of the Boston Armenian Genocide Commemoration Committee. Thank you for this proclamation and for inviting me on the solemn day to remember the Armenian Genocide perpetrated and executed by the Turkish Ottoman government during World War I between 1915 and 1923. This year marks the 108th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide and the 35th anniversary of the Sungai, Baku, and Kirovabad pogroms between 1988 and 1990 by the Azeri government in Azerbaijan against its Armenian populations. It is also the third anniversary of the 44-day war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, when over 5,000 Armenians died. It has been four months, one week, and four days since December 12, 2022, that Azerbaijan has blockaded the ethnic Armenians of Artsakh, also known as Nagorno-Karabakh by the only road, the Lachin Corridor, of its survival to and from Armenia. Azerbaijan has shut off the gas and electricity to the region and every so often turning them on and off at their whims. This constitutes a genocide according to the UN Genocide Convention. If you would note the asterisks below, they apply uh, as follows. Article 2 of the UN Genocide Convention defines genocide as any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. Killing members of the group, that's A. B, which applies to Artsakh, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, 
C, which also applies, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D also applies imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. C, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And this, all these really apply to uh, Ukraine. Article three defines the crimes that can be punished under the convention. A, genocide. B, which also applies, is conspiracy to commit genocide. C, also applies direct and public incitement to commit genocide. D, attempt to commit genocide, which also applies. C, which also applies, is complicity in genocide. I have included on uh, February 9, 2023, Amnesty International writes the following regarding this event. Blockade is a serious blow to access to healthcare in Nagorno-Karabakh. Food and fuel shortages exasperate the human rights costs of blockade. Azerbaijan fails its human rights obligations by taking no action to lift the blockade. The road which connects Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia has been inaccessible to all civilians and commercial traffic since December 12, 2022. After being blockaded by dozens of Azerbaijani protesters, widely believed to be backed by the country's authorities. And this has been proven that those who have been blockading this, they have been government personnel. The situation has left some 120,000 ethnic Armenians residents in Nagorno-Karabakh without access to essential goods and services, including life-saving medication and health care. Now, this was done, uh, written in February. We are in April now, and it's still- The blockade blocking. is still in effect? The blockade is still in It's effect. still on. And actually, today I heard that uh, illegally they have put on that road, uh, they're going to put customs, which is illegal, uh, and to prevent people going in and out. This is the only road of their survival. Terrible. This may be the beginning of the second Armenian genocide, where the first was in the beginning of the 20th century in Western Armenia, and this one in, is Eastern <laughs> Armenia now. It was April 24, 1915, 108 years to this day, that the Ottoman Turkish government orchestrated the final solution to the so-called Armenian question, debated in 1878 as to how the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire should be treated. And the official decision was made during the fog of World War I to exterminate them by means of a genocide that occurred between 1915 and 1923. During this dark chapter of civilization, the Turks committed unmentionable atrocities, killing one and a half million people. That's two thirds of the entire Armenian population that had lived there on their native lands for thousands of years. On Friday, April 21, the Armenian Genocide Commemoration Committee of Boston commemorated the 108th anniversary uh, of the genocide at the Massachusetts State House with our Senator Will Brownsberger and Representative Dave Rogers officiating. We thank the Senator and the Representative along with their staff for their steadfast support of the annual commemoration at the State House throughout many years. This month of April, we remember this terrible tragedy in history, the first genocide of the 20th century. We also focus our attention today to the survival of Artsakh and Armenia. We stand with the Armenian residents of Belmont, some of whom are descendants of the survivors. And we remind all of its residents that its leaders support and commemorate this ultimate tragedy, honoring those who perished by making this proclamation. 
during this month of April. We thank the Select Board for remembering and honoring this day and its continued support of its Armenian residents. Now, I wanted to do that over. of the Select Board, I ask the yes, of course. Uh, Holy Cross Armenian Catholic Church. <coughs> Why don't you join us up here for a moment of silence for prayer. prayer. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Jahar. Good evening, Father. Good evening. Good evening. Let us beseech the Lord through the prayers of the holy martyrs who defeated evil and endured anguish and became worthy of humanness, heavenly and everlasting crowns, through their prayers and intercession, may the Lord have mercy upon us and save us. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Christ our God, you crown your saints with triumph and you do the will of all who fear you, looking after your creatures with love and kindness. Hear us from your holy and heavenly realm by the intercession of the Holy Mother of God and by the prayers of all your saints, especially the holy martyrs who gave their lives during the Armenian genocide for faith and for the homeland. Hear us, Lord, and show us your mercy. Forgive, redeem, and pardon our sins. Make us worthy, thankfully, to glorify you with the Father and with the Holy Spirit now and always and unto the ages of ages. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Father. Jerhad, mm -hmm. you want to take a picture with the, um, take a, with the uh, proclamation? Right then, would you take a picture with the members of the board? I always love these big Also mentioned the word genocide. He has recognized before. He provides so many acts of public service. Get in the chair. I want to. You want him to know? Oh, okay, sure, of course, yeah. Oh, hello. Ready? Yes. Let's go to the park next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we missed the event. I know they didn't get the invitation, so I think you wear that. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. As always. I've been to the state house. So it, was, oh, it was very good. Actually, my son also. Oh, we did? Oh, yeah. Okay. My okay. son, my wife. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Very nice to meet you, too. Thank you. Thank you. I frankly was unaware. But we are as an eleven hours ago. I'll see you. Okay, we'll see you. Yep. Hopefully not the fourth night. Just three nights. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's an honor and, and continued privilege to, to uh, commemorate and recognize this genocide on behalf of um, all of our Armenian uh, citizens here in, in Belmont and also with, within this country as well. So. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so um, looking forward to this topic. Uh, discussion on the traffic working group middle and high school student parking issues. Is this all you, Mr. Epstein? It's just me, and it's actually a very uh, narrowly oh, okay. sure. focused discussion, which is <clears throat> in light of the, in light of the uh, <clears throat> passage of the, uh, uh, we'll take a five minute recess, five minute recess.
We're back. Well, not yet. Hold on a second. Well, I know we're not back, but oh, okay. turn the microphone back on. Matthew, I think uh, to, we're back in session. Matthew? Yeah. One second. Of course. Uh, there, there we go. Hopefully that works. Um, okay. All right. Uh, let me start over are again. We back, are we back live? <laughs> Hang on yep, we're all set. We're ready to go. Okay, great. Go ahead, uh, Roy. Please, please, please. please <clears throat> Thank you. Over. Yeah, let me start over. I am uh, Roy Epstein, and people may know that I am chair of something called the uh, Traffic Working Group Middle and High School, <clears throat> which has had the uh, task for the last uh, year and a half of trying to manage uh, student parking and pedestrian and bicycle access to the high school campus uh, with the opening of the new school. Um, my comments tonight are focused on um, what to expect for the coming year, because we we are well aware, and I'm sure many students and their parents are well aware, that the uh, <clears throat> corridor along Concord Avenue that's been designated for student parking has become quite full. Uh, there's about 140 spaces along that corridor, uh, and Anybody who's been following this issue knows that we implemented measures on the side streets that are intended to greatly discourage students from parking on the side streets and instead to channel them <clears throat> principally on the Concord Avenue. That whole corridor is essentially full. Uh, in the middle of the day now, there might be three or four or five empty spaces. <clears throat> and that number shrinks as time goes by mostly because more and more students get their licenses as they get older during the school year. Uh, we've been managing uh, operating near capacity, but the because the rink was successful, which is great, uh, there is an immediate issue. Uh, and the <clears throat> chair of the rink building committee is here who could correct any misstatements I make. But the, I believe, that during the construction period for the rink, the what we call the jug handle will not be available because it, there's going to be construction access and materials and everything. That jug handle right in front of the rink, plus the street spaces on Concord Avenue alongside the jug handle are about uh, 35 spaces <clears throat> during the day. So there will be 35 give or take cars that are displaced. And right now we only have about four open spaces on the corridor for them. And that, that number four is likely to shrink even further. <clears throat> uh, since I thought this was likely to happen, uh, I addressed the middle and the um, middle and high school building committee in January because there is a, uh, what they call a temporary parking lot um, off the driveway in the high school. And I said, you know, given the demand uh, for parking that's likely to arise with the rink and potentially other demands for the library and just general demand for parking on the campus, um, and particularly because the original plan of 90 spaces on the campus for students is not going to happen because the 90 spaces is off the table. I said it might be worth considering uh, retaining at least a portion of the temporary parking lot. And I had proposed keeping about half of it, which would be 25 spaces roughly equal to the capacity of the jug handle. It would not interfere with the landscaping plan, or I should say specifically the tree planting plan for the high school. And uh, it would go a long way to easing the stress of parking. The high school building committee now has on several occasions said they do not uh, 
intend to deviate from their originally expressed intention of removing that uh, temporary parking lot altogether. Uh, and the last I heard is that they plan to remove it uh, in early June. Uh, I, I'm not going to repeat my request to them anymore that I've made my concerns clear and they, they've made their decision. This is a decision that's made by the high school building committee. Uh, that said, uh, my thoughts now have turned to what to do in the fall when uh, there will probably be even more students because high school enrollment has been trending up. Uh, that's one reason why parking this year has been tighter than last year. If, it's, if it continues to trend up, plus this loss of 35 or so spaces by the jug handle, I think we'll leave, uh, there are only two uh, main possibilities that I can see. One is that uh, somehow when the middle school parking lot opens, that there is actually space there that could be used for students. I have no idea if that is the case. And I know originally the desire was not to allow students to park there. Uh, if students do not have any space at all uh, on the high school campus, uh, I have to say the overwhelming likelihood is that students will be allocated to parking on the side streets uh, because there's no other place to put them at this point. Uh, and I've been giving a lot of thought to a way to do that that ensures um, that this overload of parking is distributed amongst the various side streets so that no one street is, is uh, disproportionately burdened. But I think the likelihood is that most of the side streets uh, off Concord Avenue are going to see student parkers there on some kind of permit system. Um, and I just wanted to make people aware of that and uh, encourage uh, residents plus the rink and the library building committees to go talk to the high school building committee and see if there's some accommodation that can be worked out because I've always said the scarcest resource in Belmont is real estate and the school situation and the parking situation along Cockard Avenue is just a demonstration of that. Um, so that that is my report. Uh, so let me just summarize by saying, I think it would be helpful if people had, uh, people be, other than me, uh, made another attempt to work something out with the high school building committee on the temporary parking lot or parking on the campus generally. And if that fails, uh, I will come back before the town uh, before September with a proposal for what to do for school opening uh, in September. And that's my report. Thank you, Roy, for that report. Uh, well, I mean, so don't you think we should solve for this? The select board and these other committees. I mean, we, we can we can report out and you say the citizens can sort of comment on it, but if there's gonna be significant amount of traffic down there with the recon with the construction of the new rink and the construction of the library, which is taking place a year from now. So I've, uh, I've spoken to the, the chair of the rink. I think it's something we need to try to solve for right here. Yeah, I think we need to meet with the chairs of all three building committees. I agree. Um, yeah. To talk about traffic impacts and parking impacts um, during construction. Roy, what is the articulated reason for not considering uh, a temporary extension of the temporary parking lot? Uh, I wouldn't want to speak. Uh, the question was, what's the reason for we not- We have our representative yeah. here on the Middle and High School Building okay. Committee. That, um, that would be helpful. We can join us. Tom, yeah. would, you like to, would you mind joining us? And I hate to sort of bring you into this fray, but, but apparently there's been a vote of the Middle and High School Building Committee as to move forward with the deconstruction of that parking lot in front of the high school. I, I'm, I'm not the chair, but I can try. Some I know you're not the chair, but you're you're our select. Yeah, and, and Tom, I'm not even sure if the committee voted on this particular issue. I, I, yeah, I don't know that the committee the committee has taken a formal vote on it. Um, to your point, uh, other than to make the decisions that we made earlier in the year to not put the 90 parking spaces west of Harris Field, so that was a decision that was made. The Existing temporary parking lot was always considered a temporary parking lot. It was constructed as a temporary parking lot, so it's not constructed to typical standards. As such, it's 
you know, won't, won't last that long before it ultimately starts to deteriorate. And I think there's legitimate fear that if it's not ultimately either removed or replaced, that it will become problematic. There's also a fair bit of work that's been done as part of the design with a lot of community engagement throughout the process to indicate that that would be green space. And I think as much as the concerns you raised are legitimate, I think there's also competing concerns that have been raised about preserving the original design and the green space that was- uh, Can you just hold on for one minute? Can someone please silence their phone? Thank you, sir. And then the third consideration is anything that would happen there, I believe, and we should confirm this, would trigger a new review by the planning board, I think, um, which should not move forward with the to, to change the plan to remove that would reopen a planning board hearing regarding parking, which, again, is another consideration. And then the final consideration is there's a cost element associated with that. And I think everybody knows. Parking at the new middle school at some point? There will be additional parking that runs along the backside of that entire site, and then some additional parking near the front entrance of the middle school. And can you explain the 90 spaces that were planned and are not now planned? What What's the story of the 90 spaces? Correct. The determination that was made, and again, I'm not fully prepared to speak to all of this. So, so we, 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 I'll try to speak it off the cuff to the best of my ability. Um, the determination was made that those spaces um, were no longer required, um, given that the way that parking had been allocated for students, there was a belief that there was in fact sufficient parking available to, um, to accommodate that through the other mechanisms that the schools and the town had sort of had put in place. So was that part of the original planning board approval and removing it does not require a, a second it, look by the planning board? There was a second look by the plan. We have to double check this. My understanding is there was a second look by the planning board that removed it. So it was originally in place, planning board approval, then it was removed, planning board approval. So if we would have to revisit that through the planning board again, if we were to keep that spot. Not to mention this, I mean, I think there is legitimate neighborhood community concern about putting a parking lot in a place that had been expected to be green space. Um, that said, Roy, I, I think it's also to, uh, to Patrice's point, maybe worthwhile to have the various different building committees come together and discuss it. Um, Mark and I, Mark Haley and I were just looking at the current proposal for the laydown area for the rink may not necessarily have to remove all parking from that jug handle during construction. It may have to remove some for sure, and I think we're trying to figure out what that is, but it may not necessitate shutting that entire jug handle down, which may allow some of those parking spots to continue. But I think that's why the group should get together and... Well, and I, I think if not, then we're going to, when, when students start parking on the side streets and residential neighborhoods, we're going to hear about that anyway. Yeah. So I think we, we as a select board, appreciate the report out, Roy, either yourself or, my, or me or someone, you know, meets with these various committees and try to figure this out because I think we do need to commit to solving it. And not to sort of Tom, and we have no authority over the Middle and High School Building Committee and decisions that are being made there and the input they're getting from the community, but surely we have to figure out what we do as we, as we, we build the rink. And perhaps once it's completed, presumably that jug handle will be restored, correct? Yes, the intent is in the design that jug handle is, yeah. is okay. All right. maintained with two additional parking spaces. Um, why don't we see how we can sort of work, work on that? Either I can meet with them or Roy, since he has more intimate knowledge of traffic working conditions. So, And I'm happy to take the concerns as your representative back to the high school building committee again and make sure that everything that I understand right now is in fact accurate. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Tom. Appreciate yep. that. Thank you. Happy to. You want to take questions? That's a question. uh, yeah, any questions? Um, I do have a couple. Brian, are there any questions here? Emory Mahoney, please join us. Yeah, please, if you don't mind, Emory. <laughs> Traffic steers up a lot. Uh, Anne Marie Mahoney, 24 Golden Street. Of course, Anne Marie, how are you tonight? I'm nice good. to see you. Um, I think, with all due respect to Roy, and I have to congratulate Roy on doing an enormous amount of work from the time that that high school portion opened. He's been very responsive to the neighbors. He's worked with the police department, he's worked with everybody to try to make this parking situation work. So, thank you for that. But, Mark, as you know, this middle and high school traffic working group goes back to the summer of 2018, mm -hmm. where you started with it. Right, exactly. And so there is now almost a five year history of the neighbors trying to work with the building committee, with the police, with everybody involved in this parking situation. And here we are five years later, 
and there is still no reasonable solution to this situation. Five years ago, we told the building committee this was going to be a problem, and here we are. And that was when we thought there was going to be 90 spaces somewhere. Now there aren't 90 spaces anywhere. And so Concord Avenue and the side streets have been labeled by the building committee as underutilized parking assets, and that's a quote. These are residential streets. The minute you issue <coughs> permits from the high school to these students to park on the streets, our streets are no longer public. And all those people saying, oh, but they're public st streets, people should be able to park there. Not the second you issue a permit, no. They, became, they become the property of the high school. They become controlled by the high school. The permit parking areas. The permit parking areas, wherever they end up being. Right. And, and please understand that these side streets are now, I've, I've made this speech so many times. These side streets are narrow. They were designed in the 1890s. They have not been expanded. They're dangerous. We've got bicyclists, we've got pedestrians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the kids are parking all over the place. They're parking in front of the fire hydrants. They're blocking driveways, et cetera. We kind of got it all straightened out by this past fall. Again, thank you to Roy and all his work for making that happen. And we have parking restrictions before 11 o'clock in the morning, which has helped tremendously. Um, but now to put an additional however many- 35. Cars yeah. on these side streets, it's, it's just not gonna work. Beyond annoying the residents, it's just not safe. And unfortunately, if someone somewhere had listened to us five years ago, maybe there would have been a more reasonable solution on that campus. But right now there isn't. And it's unfair to put that burden on the residents. Thank you. So, Emory, if I could, so you're saying that up until this point, we, you, the residents feel, and there's others have their hands raised, of course, that it's been somewhat solved with some of the efforts by the traffic working group and Roy's leadership on it's it? It's been solved as best as it can be solved. Okay. We still have issues with kids, but yeah. there's kids, and that's, that's what's going they're to happen. They're going to park, right, where they're going to park. So, but, but now it's going to be exacerbated by the additional 35 spots, presumably, that will be eliminated. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. And again, to make the argument that there's no student parking on the campus because it's unsafe is pretty silly to me when you put student parking along Concord Avenue, forcing students to parallel park between a bike lane and rush hour traffic, which, which do you consider to be unsafe? Right. Agreed. Thank you, Maria. Appreciate the input. Back, uh, Brian Eiler. Good evening, Brian. Good evening, uh, Brian Eiler, 42 School Street. Um, I challenge Mr. Epstein's traffic working group to come up with a plan that better reflects the town's climate action plan goals, rather than a 1960s era solution of creating more parking, which enables and encourages more driving. How about increase school buses or incentivize students to ride bikes or use buses or carpool? Let's get creative and come up with policies more appropriate for 2023 rather than 1963. And worst case scenario, the office buildings at 375 and 385 Concord Ave, which are uh, just beyond West Harris Fields, uh, have over 100 free parking spaces uh, all day long. All right, those, those buildings are looking for tenants. Those buildings have huge parking lots. So th there really doesn't need to be a problem here, but, but let's, let's try to come up with creative solutions. We have lots of creative folks in town. Let's uh, look uh, to the future here. Thank you. No, I'm not going to. Okay, thank you, Brian, for that I'm input. Gonna... Uh, I think a number of kids do cycle to school, but I appreciate your input. Dan Halston. Good evening, Dan. How are you tonight? You need to unmute yourself. There okay, you go. I'm, I'm, I'm on. Uh, uh, good evening, Dan Halston from Ken Myrtle Street. First, I just want to say congratulations to Ms. Dion. Elizabeth, good for you, good for the town. Uh, um, thank you, Dan. So nice to hear your voice again. We miss you. Yeah, uh, miss you too. Um, so I understand that the traffic working group will be revisiting its plans in the neighborhood and just wanted to point out the disproportionate burden placed on Myrtle Street under the existing plan and ask that it be reconsidered as part of a holistic parking plan. Uh, Mr. Epstein noted that the traffic working group has taken measures to discourage parking 
on the side streets and, and, and the group has. Um, but at prior meetings of the traffic advisory committee and the traffic working groups, several of us raised our concerns that Myrtle Street was not being treated consistent with the other Golden Street neighborhood streets. There are parking restrictions on the other Golden Street neighborhood streets that Anne Marie uh, mentioned just now that are not applied to Myrtle Street, ostensibly because Myrtle Street has an existing chicane traffic pattern that was put in place because Myrtle Street is much less wide. Indeed, I went out and measured it, some 44 inches less wide than Golden Street. And it was determined um, that it would be unsafe for emergency safety vehicles to allow parking on both sides of the street. But more to the point, the parking rules for the Golden Street neighborhood streets should be the same. And the test should be to require the same number of cars on each street, whatever that be. Um, and that is true for the streets east of Myrtle Street, but not for Myrtle Street, where we've borne a disproportionate burden of the parking. What we have now is Myrtle Street supporting high school students each morning. Every spot on the west side of the street is filled halfway up the block for at least eight parkers, whereas there's a complete ban, a complete parking ban on the streets to the east of Myrtle. We were told the town would revisit this approach after the school year started, but nothing's been done. I have photographs showing the disproportionate burden of the impact on Myrtle Street uh, that I'd be happy to share with the uh, select board and, and with Mr. Epstein and the working group. Um, it really, the pictures tell, tell more than I can explain right here. Towns should take a holistic approach and the burdens of parking and traffic from the high school should be borne equally across the neighborhood as a matter of fairness and safety. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, please share those photos. Send it to our inbox. Will do. Okay, uh, Deborah Talanian. Deborah. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, thanks very much. Um, 30 Golden Street. Please, please identify yourself, Deborah. Deborah Talanian, 30 Golden Street. Yep. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Two things. One, um, I think it was about a year and a half ago, um, I was going back and forth with Bill Lavallo. Because I, I think it was two years ago uh, when the high school first opened. And I, um, I wandered onto uh, the campus to the back lot to just look at the parking situation. I did that a couple of times. And I counted, you know, and I saw people that were clearly construction people with trucks. And it seemed that with, and of course, the temporary parking lot was was there on the side, and then there was the parking in the back. I counted um, amongst those, there were some empty spaces, but there were also a lot of trucks that I figured once this building is, is finished, that would go away. And so I counted like 45 cars. And I communicate, communicated this to Bill, and I believe um, he found 15. I don't know if those are, I think you were only counting the ones on Concord Avenue. Roy, but I think they added 15 on the campus. And my suggestion would be that um, they may find, you know, the middle school people, you know, from where they're parking and they might have this, a similar situation. They might be able to find some spaces uh, that have been occupied by construction people. I haven't been over on that side, but I'm just saying. Um, the other thing is, just a matter of fact, um, on Lower Godin, in the, over the past few months, there are um, four homes in a row, mine being one of them, have had you know permitted work being done. Um, and I've certainly contributed to uh, my share of trucks that, you know, um, people delivering that goods and working. Uh, yeah, Marie, I know you as well. And yeah, Adam, um, so like four. And I, I can't imagine, um, you know, I, with all the other things that go on on Lower Godin, adding back the student parking because it was really crazy here. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Um, there's another Deborah in line. Is that you, uh, Deborah? But no last name. <coughs> you need to be admitted as a panelist too. Um, You're not as a panelist. Can you admit? Was a panelist? Sure. Deborah, the same Deborah. Deborah. I think it might have been Deborah telling in. No? Deborah? Okay, let's go to Amy Tannenbaum. Yep. Amy, you've been admitted to the meeting. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Patricia will admit you as a panelist. Yep. 
Yes, Deborah. Uh, do you, yes, Amy. Um, well, we did for a moment there, and now we lost you. Okay, can you admit her again? Yeah. There you go, Amy. You now me? admit. Yeah, good evening. Uh, so, you know, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please okay. identify yourself. Yeah, Amy Tannenbaum, 21 Golden Street. So I have sort of two parts here. The first is I want to echo the gentleman who spoke about climate issues, and I want to re-mention the complexity that I do not understand. So my first question is a governance question, and then my second question is a specific suggestion. I do not understand the structure in our town in terms of the schools. So the schools are making all kinds of decisions which affect all other kinds of parties. And I don't understand where the schools report into, who has an ability to talk about things with the schools or are the schools just able to make independent decisions. So my specific recommendation, which I have made many, many times. Can, is, I, can I just answer that question on the schools? Sure. Uh, the school department reports to an elected uh, school committee. And so the school committee, you know, no different than the select board is accountable to the residents of this community. So the school department reports to the school committee, the school committee oversees all uh, matters relating to the schools, including land that is under their purview, which is in fact where the middle and high school building committee is, building is. But go ahead, Amy, for your suggestion. So I would hope that the select board has some influence or ability to help move things forward. The thing I have yet to understand is why we do not have a different financial solution to the busing issue. So for lots of reasons, whether it be climate, whether it be traffic, whether it be safety, we know it's better when students are bused, but it's a huge disincentive because we charge a fortune for our bus you know, membership. And if you have two children, it's really, really expensive. We now have a host of new students who are gonna to come to the school who might more likely not worry that it's uncool to ride the bus and be riding the bus. Um, I don't understand why we've been talking for five years and yet I have, maybe there's something I don't know about. I have yet to hear a plan that in, I, I hear plans and I see bike racks, that's great, but I do not see a plan to, to change the financial structure to incentivize bus riders. Um, we should absolutely do that. I know that there are issues with timing and all kinds of other things, but this is about getting people to get on the bus instead of driving a car to school. We should make it really expensive to drive a car and a privilege. Our town is not that big. There are parts of town that are far, but for the most part, our town is not that big. And yet we enable many, many students, almost all of them not carpooling, and we make buses super incredibly expensive. This is a really simple financial model that should help us, and I yet have yet to see any action on it. And maybe I'm talking to the wrong people. This has been mentioned multiple times. Maybe it's not a priority. I don't understand it. But it is absolutely one of the things that we should be doing so that we, especially with middle school students, et cetera, we build a habit of riding the bus and we make it doable for families who are pinched um, and who are going to do what is less expensive. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Uh, the select board look for every opportunity to work with the school community and the schools, and we have a good working and collaborative working relationship. Uh, these issues are complex, as you as you indicate, and well, Mark, uh, Mark mentioned as well that you know we need to try and solve uh, this. Good. It wasn't my intention to make this a uh, meeting. Form, the, yeah, well, yeah, a lot but, of people have but, concerns. No, I mean, because we could. This, this will keep the separate body of the uh, traffic working group busy um, clearly, through the summer. Well, yeah. But uh, just as a specific response here, the school committee did vote recently to reduce bus fees by about 25%. So next year will be an experiment to see what difference that makes. Uh, right, agreed. Uh, well, we do have the chair of the school committee, well, did have her hand raised. Do we admit her? No, there she is. Meg, uh, why don't you join us? Uh, we have the chair of the school committee, Meg Moriarty, that's raised her hand. Um, Can you Good evening, Meg. How are you? Oh, I'm good. How are you, Mark? Doing well. Thanks for joining us on this important topic. Um, yeah, I was just tuning in, and I appreciate the um, the comments from um, some of the the previous speakers. And I would just echo um, what um, Roy Epstein just mentioned: is that we did um, for the first time, and uh, I think since John Phelan has been here, superintendent decrease 
our busing fees. Um, we are really thankful for um, the work that uh, both Larry Link and Dave Coleman from the Traffic Advisory Council did with um, our district leadership this year. Um, they put out a survey which had, I think, 34% response rate. Um, we, we are really trying to look at how we can increase ridership um, and, and we're working in the constraints of a strained budget. So we, we have decreased um, busing fees for next year in hopes that we will increase that ridership and we'll have to see how it goes. But it is certainly something um, that, that the school committee is also committed to continuing to look at. Um, I think another thing that we're committed to looking at that really needs to be addressed um, would be start times because um, that would also allow us to potentially get more kids on buses um, with a, that would be a little bit more maybe economically feasible for us, um, but that'll take a little bit of time. Meg, can I just ask quickly, do you know what uh, the school charges for parking permits or do they charge at all for parking permits? Uh, we do, I know that they do not charge um, for parking permits at this time. Meg, you know, um, select board will work in whatever way we can with you collaboratively to address this issue because I think we have to help, you know, collectively try and solve for it. Um, I agree with Brian Eiler. I think too many people drive cars. I mean, I know I drive my car everywhere, and we need to make this more of a pedestrian, cycling, a pedestrian walking and, you know, cycling community, but that's challenging, right? It's really challenging. I, I do think, um, given the point made earlier, if, if they were to charge for parking permits that suddenly changes the economics. It so. could. I, I, I really think we should. Let's move on. Yeah. Move on so, because this is. This is getting uh, to it, trying to this, solve for we, something. We could, stay, we could stay here for weeks. Yeah, we could talk for traffic. I was chair of the traffic committee for six years, so traffic is a big issue in town. So, All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on. Appreciate all your comments. Uh, thank you, Roy, for that report out. And um, we will work together to try to solve for this. Yep. Really. Um, particularly feel for the neighbors uh, and the residents of Golden Street in particular that as Amory points out, they've been talking about this for over five years. We haven't quite solved for it, have we? No. Okay. Um, Mark Healy is here uh, from chair of the, um, uh, the Belmont Skating Rink Building Committee and along with Tom Caputo as well and to give us an update on what's going on. And again, Mark, um, I saw your election evening. I want to congratulate um, you and your leadership and all members of the building committee. And uh, it's exciting to have a successful vote. We certainly want to thank the residents of this community for um, supporting, um, I know it's another tax increase, but supporting the new rink in our town. I appreciate your leadership and time your service as well in the building, building committee. I know you guys, are, all of you on the building committee, and Marie included, uh, put in a lot of hours. And I think because of that and the credibility that you established resulted in a very successful and mandate vote. So. It's exciting to know that at some point in time we'll have a new rink in, in town. So thank you very much. Thank you. Right, thank you, Mark. So first, let's start off with congratulations on your new seat. <laughs> uh, the first is, of course, on May 3rd. We're going to be in front of the, you know, it's a special town meeting. Talk, I've talked to Mike Widmer about that. Yep. I think we're co-presenting or I'm presenting and you're going to be Correct. as well. And that'll be at 7.30 on the 3rd. So within a, within a special time meeting, that's correct. Within a special time meeting. So tonight, I, I um, want to just say that Patrice, through Pam, is trying to set up a meeting with the three chairmen of the various committees to talk about exactly parking. Okay, good. But it was set for next Wednesday, then it moved to next this Thursday, but we'll get a date. Thank right? you. So, so we'll try start. to get and talk that through. Okay. Good. Okay. So what I thought I'd give you tonight is just a kind of a three month look ahead where we are going and to get to our goal, which is having a ring, rink open in November, December of 2024. We need the stars aligned very, very carefully to get all of these things done. One of the way we decided as a committee to get there is to engage a CM at risk, which is how the high school is being built it's how the Wellington School was built, and they manage the whole process. But to do this, we have to do it in pieces going forward, as opposed to having a full set of contract documents that we bid. And if we did that, it's probably six months out to get all those in place, bid it. We wouldn't start construction until sometime late fall this year, which would put us way behind the eight ball where if we go with a CM at risk, we can have packages, and I'll give you some examples, is one would be a demol demolition package, which would take the rink down. We'd have an early 
site package, which would do cut and caps for all the utilities. That probably comes first. Then we'd have a foundation package, which would put in the new foundations for the building and, and, and the rink. And then we'd start building from there. So all of these things have to come together so we can get there. The other is we're looking at what lead items or what items do we need to buy for this facility that have long lead times. One of the things we've identified already, and we haven't finished the whole list or the study, is we need to, the HVAC systems right now are a 40, potentially a 40 week lead time. So we would need to order those early on to get them when we need them. Yes, the, these that's elevators, uh, HVAC systems and the like. And, and that's why I wanna have a CM that it deals with this all the time. And we would be able to order them through that as opposed to waiting to design, bid, build, and then have to order it. We would never get the rink in a year. And just so you, you understand, we're trying to do this rink so we're only closed for one year. Mark, would you bid out all these phases separately? We bid these out separately, that's correct. So there'd be constant rounds of bidding because you have that's, that's different phases. Some, some couldn't be done bidding through the CM. If they're not a file sub bid, they can be bid through the CM. But the CM goes out and gets prices, brings it back to the committee and we approve this contractor to do that work. Most of it is the early ones is demolition, earthwork, that can be hired, they, they can hire them direct as opposed to the committee, the building committee having to go out with a bunch of packages on their own. That would be very difficult, right? That's why I wanna to try to get it under a seat. But let me just go through this. So in May, we're gonna complete the contract documents for demolition. We're gonna define the scope of work for the enabling package through the CM, through the OPM and the building committee. And this Wednesday, I have a meeting with the Bellamont Electric Light Department to talk about transformers, switch gears, where it is. I now find out the lights at the softball field are also run through the transformer and switch gear at the rink, same as Harris Field. That would be an early site package that we need to get done because we can't shut the lights out in the middle of the summer for that if we tried to, but those have to be done before we demolish the rink. Um, we're also meeting with a hazardous waste person on Wednesday, and we're also meeting with the rink designer to look at what pieces in the rink are salvageable, not to necessarily use in our rink, but maybe we can sell them <coughs> and get money back. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Correct, like the boards, the glass, maybe even the chiller barrel, whatever he thinks we can sell or auction, we would do that so then we have income. That will be the intent. Um, we're going, we're put preparing a RFQ for the CM at risk and we'll put that out on the street, advertise it, similar to what we did, Mark, if you remember, for the architect and the OPM, we'll go through that same process. We'll get proposals in, we'll interview these, and we'll select one that we wanna go with. Um, and I, I talked about the hazardous building materials and they were gonna do some geotechnical work for, um, and I have a proposal. What's hazardous within that rink? Is As Everything. I don't know yet. Yeah, well, I don't think there's a lot of asbestos. It might be in the mechanical room, but the rest of it is probably lead, probably lead paint of anything. Topic, yeah. But that was one of the reasons why we went to the full demolition. So we didn't have to de lead all the beams to strengthen them. Yeah, good yeah. Makes, makes okay. sense. So that, that gets through May. And in June, we'd advertise for the demolition of the, in the early site package, as I talked about a minute ago. We'd like to engage the CM at risk. Uh, we'd finalize a list of long lead items and potentially place equipment orders if we had a CM on board and continuing develop CDs for the risk. The CDs for the risk, uh, sorry, for the rink in the sports facility will be done sometime in July, August timeframe. So we'd be ready to then start to bid those pieces way out to various contractors for the shell, the, the bed of the rink, the board, whatever we're buying. Have you resolved whether it's going to be stick built or pre-engineered building? We'd like to go pre-engineered. That's one of the other reasons I want to go see them at risk. I want to go, and that comes down here in the next thing, which is July, is going out to get pricing from pre-engineered metal building contractors. They would, But they would have a contract with the CM at risk, not directly with the town. But we can do that under 149A, which we could not do that under 149. Those are the two uh, ways you can contract in the town. Okay. Okay. So in July, early July, we'd award the uh, site package and the demolition package, engage a pre-engineered designer for the building structure, the shell, 
coordinate with CM construction package and schedule, get a whole schedule because what having met with Patrice and Jennifer, we're looking for a schedule and a burn rate so that she has a sense of what dollars we need as we go forward for this, because we'll spend a lot of dollars over the first year because it's a sense that we're trying to get it done. So between now and next September, we'll be done. And then continue on with the CD packages that we'll hopefully we'll get in July. But we're essentially now meeting on a weekly basis. The committee meets every other week. And uh, I meet with the architect every week with maybe a smaller group of our uh, committee members. All right. Mark, that's a lot. And thank you again for your leadership. And I'm glad you decided. I don't have anything else to do. Yeah, yeah, I know you rejoined the team there. We sort of coaxed you back in to sort of lead the efforts for the ring. Let me rebuild the committee and then the build, building committee. And so thank you for that. And we need key man insurance on marketing. <laughs> uh, in terms of, um, I know you're working closely with our interim on treasurer Patrice on, on you know, raising all the capital, right? Um, Correct. We, we I know the met and we're going to continue to meet with. It sounds to me that we need a substantial sort of commitment early on, right, from a financial perspective. Because yes. it sounds like we have a pretty quick build. Especially if we have to buy equipment early on, Mark. Right. That's, and that's I see. time orders are 40 weeks. I mean, I guess supply chain is still there, I suppose, right? Supply chain is slow for a lot of that equipment. Yeah. So if everything goes perfectly well, Mark. You have to pay until delivery. delivery on that equipment. You have to, to pay the delivery. deposit and then we'll just pay it to but If everything goes perfect, right, which it won't, um, but, you know, as close to perfect as possible, what's what's the... The intent would be November to December, early December of 2024. The high school season starts the Monday after Thanksgiving. We'd like to have it open by then. So the goal which you and I have been talking about this for quite some time. I know you've talked to Roy as well and Elizabeth, is to lose one season, only one season. That's correct. Okay. So Mark, the design uh, was pretty far along um, by the beginning of the month, but it was still, um, it was still a, more of a concept drawing because there's a huge amount of detailed design work that remains. That, that's why they, we have the three months, I'm still not done yet. I'm not done until August, Roy, with the detailed design. The mechanical people have to design all the mechanical. So all those systems and infrastructure will be spec'd out by the summertime? Yes. Okay. So then sometime in the fall, we'd be ready to start, you know, going out for price of uh, bidding and acquiring contractors to build those mechanical systems. A rink is, is really just a big mechanical box, if you will, yeah. a big refrigerator. But it has a lot of pieces. Yes. So I, I understand and certainly um, appreciate the desire to miss only one one season. Does phasing the building this way as opposed to doing it as a single package have an impact on the final cost? I think it'll be less. Great. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> the, the reason is, is be, and, Roy, and Roy and I have had this discussion with Mark, and the, the reason where we can save it is if we can do a pre-engineered metal building, yep. that's the cheap, the, and that's just the shelf. Yep. You buy that shell much cheaper than if you buy the pieces to build it. We will pay a little bit more for the CM at risk because they'll have a higher fee. But because it's, it's the schedule is so short, yeah. they pay they charge it by general conditions by month. But well, our, our months are relatively short. Not like the high school, which has gone on. I, I certainly you know, don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish. If we can invest money up front to have a better result and a cheaper outcome, then we should do that. Correct. And I and I really don't want to have a low bidder building a rink that we want for 50 years because what you we have, a, we have a fire station that would suggest otherwise, right? <laughs> they fire, went the ongoing work with the fire station. The ongoing fire station is designed, bid, built. Yeah. So if, if this is yeah, what you pay for. If this is not a low bidder contract award, how is it done? <coughs> CM buys out the piece. That's what I'm saying. The CM buys out the pieces, and that's when we interview them. I want an open book CM. So he comes to us with three or four pricing for different quality contractors, presents what his recommendation would be. We look at it, is it within our budget? We proceed with that contract. He, he then gives that contractor the notice to proceed and we start. And individual packages are in, in fact bid out. Yes. In a competitive bid process. Correct. So but it's not, a form, it's not a formal bid that you know, it comes in. Yes, we get pricing and we know what the pricing is, but it's not a formal bid price. This is, the high school was done the same way, like the earthwork contractors were four or five earthwork contractors that bid on, that priced it for them, and then they chose WL French. 
That's how that's done. It's bought through the CF. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, it does. Okay. All right. So uh, thanks for the report out, Mark. We appreciate that. And perhaps we can schedule you on a monthly basis if that makes sense. I do. I have one final comment. I, I, I'd, I'd say it's more like four to six weeks. Six to eight weeks, maybe. Six weeks. Okay, that's fine. And I was going to suggest, I, I think we should probably come back to this group with an update once we've had a chance to flesh some of this stuff out. As mm -hmm. you've outlined, as you and I discussed today, there's a lot that has to come together perfectly for this to work. And I think as we turn over a bunch of additional cards in the next few weeks and months, we'll have a sense as to whether or not we can hit that timeline. And, this, and if there are... Early, early, late May, early June. So just to return to the point Mark raised before, uh, I think we'll need a cash flow model and because you're going to need a good amount of money up like by July 1, it sounds like. And then the, as I sent to Jennifer the other day, the demolition with any hazardous material we have, we, it's around running around a million dollars to demolish the rink and remove any of the hazardous material. And Jennifer was, I gave her that the other day, but we'll, when we come in June, hopefully we can give you a schedule and a cash flow Jennifer. and a burn. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, so Mark, why don't you let us know when, when in terms of uh, have periodic sort of updates would be really helpful. Please, so we can wait as reason and sometime late, late May. Um, Jennifer, how are you tonight? I'm well, Mark. Thank you very much. I'm interested in hearing this conversation. Thank you. I just wanted to to note that uh, some of the um, the items that that Mark was mentioning about ordering ahead of time, we need to have the authorization for the bonding in ahead of time for those, but we don't necessarily have to have the cash on hand until we actually receive the items. So that that makes a bit of a difference. The demolition clearly will need to have some cash on hand, and so that's important for us to to understand. And so we're we'll have those ongoing conversations. Great, right, Jennifer. Thank you for your leadership there as well and ongoing efforts in the Treasury Department. Okay, thank you both. Appreciate you coming. I'm not really going to take any public comments on this. Uh, we're about 40 minutes. I asked one question. Yeah. You indi indi indicated earlier that this warrant committee presentation. Is that something you did? The warrant committee would. Uh, on Thursday evening, League of Women Voters. Um, Pam, Pam's supposed to reach out. Pam's supposed to reach out. Warrant briefing on Thursday that they, you may want yeah. to um, at least dial into. Okay, and then on oh, Thursday. This Thursday, yeah, it's a League of Women Voters warrant briefing at 7.30 that will be moderated by the chair of the warrant. Okay, and Wednesday night, there's a meeting here with Precinct 1 and 7 that they've asked me to attend. Yeah, and uh, there was a warrant committee meeting on Wednesday. You haven't asked me, been asked to attend that, have you? No. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, thank I appreciate you. your time and effort. Thank you, Emory. Thank you, Tom. I'm not taking any public comment here. We're running about 50 minutes behind. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, we have a number of citizens petition. We also have the other Warren articles as well that you'll need to take permit. What are the Warren articles? Um, Article 3. Yeah, that's fine. We can do that. But shouldn't we just go through the treasury? Okay. Boy, Carmen's here on the polar matter, so we're running behind. Um, but I, well, I, I, I think um, in order, um, we have three citizens, four citizens petitions. And the COLA discussion, Floyd, I'm sorry, we've been delayed here, is going to have to be after that because I think it needs to take some time as well. And so and I don't think she's here, but she is online. Why don't we admit her on the first one? And so, uh, Patrice, on this one here, uh, we met and we went around the block on this several times. Yep. Right? And so I don't know exactly where we stand. We see a, see a will, comment from George Hall. Maybe yeah. Walk us through. Is, is, it, is it the full citizen petition or is it just a component of that. So what George G is she yep. you all follow we, we we talked about this several times we we raised our, our parking um we also I don't know if this is in Jamie McIsaac Jamie mm -hmm. McIsaac did send us an email, an email as well I know that right <laughs> um so just the chief is here as well as the chief no because I just I wanted to point out where we where we have landed. where where have we landed yes Thank and you. I don't know what happened with G she She's not there. Jumped off. Yep. So backing back and forth conversations with G, with Jamie, and admit it with the board. What we decided to do was um, I asked George for a motion to put forward to town meeting, and what it honestly just essentially does is takes G's citizens petition with the bylaw and it cuts out on D under obstructions three, the first sentence that starts with fines of violations. That sentence comes out and then her other suggestions stay in, which is 
Um, under three, it says the town will communicate at least annually to the residents of the town the requirements of this section 60 800. Okay, so, so let me let me just sort of so what you're saying is that article six that's in the warrant currently yep. is the full citizen petition G that you've as she presented. Correct. Good evening, G. How are you tonight? Um, you've been admitted. You can unmute yourself. Hello, so everyone. Good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're going through this issue one more time. Article six. So, article six in the warrant, as it currently stands, includes everything that you know with, that was in the citizen petition. And what you're now telling us, or you're telling us this, that the only things that. So, how do we? How will so article George, six be amended, or will no, it be George, George has worked with Mike Widmer. And if this motion goes to the floor, it will be within the four corners of the article. It'll um, meet the issues that G has in regards to the vehicle piece, as well as the communi communication, which I'm fine with. But what about the penalty provisions that are in here? That would be taken out due to the fact that the board increased the fines at their last meeting. How are they taken out if it's already in the warrant? It does. It's not included in the motion. All right, G. Uh, this is your petition. What are your thoughts on that? Have you? Been communicating with Patrice on this yep. and talking to our town council, or yes, I spoke with Patrice please, on it. You and just I identify yourself, Chief. Please, yes. that'd be great. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah. Hi, uh, Ji and Huang, a town meeting member, uh, precinct eight. So I spoke with Patrice, and um, uh, I am in support of uh, her proposal, which is to uh, take out the language of uh, the fine schedule that I had proposed. Uh, because you had to increase that um, in your previous meeting um, and keep the um, language of uh, clarifying that it does include vehicles as well as the language of communication. So those are the only two provisions that will remain from your citizen's petition as part of this motion. Correct. How we feel about that, folks? Uh, I feel fine about it. I think, I think it's a good solution. Perfect. Thank you, G, for being flexible on this. Um, first of all, thank you for raising the issue. It is important. It does matter, but also appreciate your willingness to, to work to reach a compromise solution. So, our, thank you, Jay. So, our motion uh, here to recommend favorable action will be as um, um, recommend favorable action as it relates to the revised motion. Yes. So, do I have a motion to recommend favorable action uh, for the revised motion under Article Six? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I'm sorry we're running late. We appreciate that. We look forward to your presentation. I believe on what night? She's night one. I'm night one. Night one. Thank you, everyone. You take care. All the best. Okay. Um, yep. I think Mike was gonna, Mike Woodmer is on. Oh, Mike. Uh, me. Mike, you're going to correct us. Okay. Now that we took the motion, it's too late. <laughs> no, we just to, Mike, night we two. We, It'll probably be night two. Be night two. Yes. Mike, we were sort of petitioning here not to go four nights, but we'll have to see on that, right? Well, I think we could do three. <laughs> we can do three. We can do it three. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Appreciate okay. it. If you want to, Mike, if you want to stay on, we'll stay admitted because we have two, uh, three other citizens' petition. Yes. If you don't mind, be part of the panel here discussion. That'd be great. Okay. So the next citizens' petition um, is um, Article Seven. No. So Article Seven. What's happening in Article Seven? That is the development impact study. Has that been deferred? Or? It is, yep, that goes to segment B. That's going to segment B? Okay, so that's, Mike, that's going to be in segment B, Article 7, right? Correct. Right. We need to take a position on that. Uh, we'll come back on the others, folks, um, colleagues, because um, we have to vote on 3, 4, and 5, right? 2, 3, 4, and 5. Yeah, I don't think 4. Glenn's here for the easement. Glenn's here for the easement. Yeah, but let's get through this. the other two. Citizen petition. Okay. Uh, four is also being uh, deferred to segment B. All right. So four is being deferred. That's correct. So we need to vote on that tonight. No. Nope. That correct. That's right. So we have to vote on two, three, and five. And eight. Two, yeah. Three, five. Uh, six. Uh, we have to go to um, eight, uh, which is Article Six. It's eight. It's in citizen petition that, that's been. Um, sponsored by Thomasina Olson, who I think is online. We just admitted her. So, Tommy, good evening. Um, uh, please identify yourself and uh, you could um, talk to us about Article 8. Okay, I think I finally uh, figured. Okay, you yes, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak to you all um, artic uh, regarding Article 8. 
I've been producing the Payson Park Music Festival. So Tommy, please identify yourself oh, as well. Oh, Thomasina Olson. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Town meeting member, Precinct 5, and uh, president producer of the Payson Park Music Festival. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I've been producing the Payson Park Music Festival for the residents of Belmont for the past 32 seasons. The 33rd season begins on June 14th with Jay Ottaway, who has a global musical presence. The remaining 11 concerts feature Belmont residents and other musicians with national reputations, including a variety of genres, Beatles, country, bluegrass. In 1990, when the concert series was first proposed to the Recreation Commission, it was believed that no one would be in Belmont during the summer. We now know that many residents stay in town during the summer and by positioning the series on Wednesdays made it possible for folks who may have taken or planned to take a long weekend. The goal was to offer quality concerts using available resources without straining the town's budget and to utilize our beautiful parks, which were then un underutilized. After 30 years, the Recreation Department required additional payment for insurance, which Payson Park Music Festival pays and payment for use of the park. Article eight addresses this question of payment for the parks. First of all, there is no added cleaning costs to the town because Payson Park audiences leave the park in a clean condition as confirmed by Mr. Frank Sartori, whose staff maintains the park. Now, I believe there were some slides that I sent to James earlier. I'm not sure if they're up in front of you. What are the slides for, Tommy? You do? What are the slides in regard to this article? Uh, well, there are the <coughs> picturing all the parks. I start, all the, all the parks pictured here are under the Recreation Department. I believe it's Payson Park um, is one, all of this, uh, I, I'd have, to, so my slides did not get posted. Um, I'm looking. We're looking for them, please, please continue. Okay, well, That's the fine. first part was there, time. like, I, I identified Payson Park, Grove Street, um, Chenery, back of Chenery, which is, a, we would have thought, school department, but it's actually, um, uh, it's actually under recreation. Um, there are a couple more, uh, I said Grove Street, PQ, um, I think Winbrook is also pictured there and town field, which may not be pictured there. All of those parks come under recreation, which means that to use any of those parks, yeah, you can just slide through those. Yeah, quickly. go ahead, Tommy, yeah, right. Um, so all of the parks are under the recreation department, um, which requires a payment for use of the parks. Um, well, no, to Tommy, let's just be clear. It's not payment for the use of the parks. It's for special events, presumably, right? I mean, I think residents can use the parks without paying, right? Isn't this yeah, for specific right. events that are scheduled there? Yeah, no. go ahead. I'm, so, go ahead. Yes. Um, as a town meeting member, I've always voted for the rec department budget. FY22 and 23 budgets included a million dollars plus for the recreation department. I've also pictured their organization chart. By contrast, Payson Park has a board of directors, no staff, only volunteers, a very flat organization. The most recently submitted form PC ending December 2021, uh, next slide, yeah, resident volunteers. Next slide, which is the last. Um, this is the most recent form PC, which for December 2021, which is required by the attorney general's office, demonstrates how Payson Park uses its donations to primarily support musicians and programming. Payson Park has recently added videos to the concerts so residents can enjoy their favorite concerts again and again. This warrant article is offered to recognize any nonprofit 501c3 local, local nonprofit um, that provides service to all Belmont residents for free. In this case, music um, is free to all residents of the community. I ask the board support of Article 8 because I believe our parks belong to all residents and are already paid for 
by Belmont residents tax dollars. Further, that a not-for-profit organization which uses all of its revenues to produce live entertainment and videos for free to all Belmont's residents should not be charged for use of the town's parks. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Tommy, appreciate I that. It's clearly, um, you know, do appreciate um, the uh, good work of the Pace and Park Music Festival and all the things they've done for the community. What this article does, Tom, I want to ask you a question. I did a little bit of research on this. This would apply to every single 501c3 organization in Belmont, correct? There's some stipulations. Number one, you have to be domiciled in Belmont. Right. Number two, the programs have to be free to the residents. Okay. So I believe there's like over 300 501c3 organizations in Belmont some of which you know, Belmont Day School, Belmont Hill School, Belmont, some of the youth sports programs as well. So they, they would all be, if this article were to be successful, exempt from paying a fee, correct? So none of these- I don't, know about, kind of I don't know about any of the others, Mark. All I know, I mean, I was focusing on the concert series. No, I understand Belmont that. I understand Day why- Belmont Day School charges. Belmont no, well, Day School. Well, well, we don't know that. Charges. We don't know that because what, what you're suggesting here is that the over 360 501c3 organizations would be exempt for paying very modest recreational fees when they schedule a specific event. These are not just re residents that attend these parks. So I just wanted to point that out. I know that the intent, your intent here is to, um, you do not want to pay some park music festival uh, to pay this fee. Uh, so this broad article, you know, includes all of these uh, organizations. I don't know if Carl- I disagree with you. I disagree Mark, with you. Mark, I think you're hitting the nail on the head, which is that this is um, a proposal that is clearly intended for a single organization. Um, and it then has a lot of unintended consequences. So even though it's written um, for a number of organizations, I, no one doubts the value of the Pace and Park Music Festival, but it seems to me that Brandon Fitz and the Recreation Department implemented this fee for a reason. It is not an honor. Well, it's the Recreation Commission as well. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. yeah um, I, I think that setting policy on the basis of a single organization is, is unwise and a poor precedent. Which I would agree with you. Um, but I don't also believe, I also believe you are taking uh, this out of context. The other 501c3s all charge for use of whether well, we, you're talking about a school, they all charge. This is for free. Well, we don't know about that, Tony, but thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Roy. Well, <clears throat> just reading the article literally, it says the event is open to the public and attendees are not charged a fee. So I, I think there are many events where the audience is not charged a fee and it's open to the public. Um, so I think the scope would be more than just Pace and Park Music Festival, but more broadly, uh, you know, Tommy, you know, you and I discussed this, uh, I think, in the fall. And uh, I ended up having a conversation with at least one member of the Rec Commission to understand where the fee came from uh, that was being charged. And they did their best, they took their best shot at estimating, as I understand it, on average, what does it cost to deal with a special event um, where there's a significant number of people there? And, you know, we agreed in this conversation uh, with the Rec Commission, the cost was probably more than zero, uh, but it's not astronomical. They came up with a charge of, I think it's $50. 35 each hour. 35. Um, so given that it was very likely more than zero and, and up to some reasonable level, I didn't see that their number was obviously wrong. Um, and then when you and I spoke, uh, you told me that uh, you didn't think the appropriate course was some sort of discount for nonprofit organizations. You told me the price should be zero. And I, and honestly, I thought that was uh, also an extreme position because in the judgment of a lot of people who deal with these events 
all the time, the costs were not zero. And if it's really $35 or in that ballpark, uh, you know, without devoting lots of uh, scientific study to this, it seemed like uh, a, a fee that was not obviously erroneous, which is a standard that uh, I'd like to use. And for that reason, I think given that we ought to charge something, uh, I think the existing fees seem reasonable. Respectfully, uh, Roy, what exactly does the town do? If we were to leave the park in um, a terrible shape, uh, the, the other features of that park are a, there's, there's a bathroom that is maintained for everyone. There's T-ball at that site. There's other events. The one day of the week that the concerts are there, um, it is not there. If you would explain to me what exactly recreation has to do, that they- I, mean, I, 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 I cannot account that this was a process followed by the Recreation Commission. They did spend quite a bit of time <clears throat> discussing it. I'm not here to second guess them. I didn't attend those meetings, but I respect- I attended them. it. And I, the, I, argument, I, the, the argument proposed, we have to make one rule for everyone, regardless if they're a not-for-profit, regardless if the programs are free, regardless uh, if there's no feature, uh, there, you know, if there's no, if you, I, one of the reasons I put the, out, I contrasted the organization chart of recreation to the organization for Payson Park Music Festival was to show you, we run very lean, we run as volunteers, um, I, you know, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, their argument was, well, we're going to make one rule for everyone, for profit, not for profit, doesn't matter. Oh, okay, so I happen to agree with that. I have I, to think that a single rule makes sense. I, like I, I'm not in a position to second guess the judgment of the Recreation Commission on this issue. And then secondly, I, I suspect, though I don't know, that the majority of events held in the parks actually involve nonprofit organizations. I don't see profit making right. companies sponsoring events in the parks. So I think the, we're going to so was I, I just so let me just say I don't I don't see what the Recreation Commission has arrived at is unreasonable. It sounds reasonable to me. Well the Recreation Commission lumped Pace and Park in with the, the programming that's done in the summer for children's sports programs. Those are obviously, if I were a parent of a 10-year-old, uh, I'd probably want to send my child. There was a very good program that runs over at PQ. Um, I'd probably pay for that. They lumped right. Payson Park Music Festival as a not-for-profit not into the same category. And, and in answer, you know, the, one size doesn't always fit. Yeah, Tommy, um, I mean, this article is a one size where it takes into, into account well well over 300 not-for-profits in town, many of them are tiny, uh, likely not going to rent the park, but it exempts every single one of them from paying a fee for maintenance of our parks, a very modest, insignificant fee. And we've talked about this as well, that perhaps you could fundraise for. And so... I can't find myself supporting this simply because it's it's a broad application to well over 300 organizations in town that would be exempt, including some large ones. Uh, let me let Is me. It if not true that we spend one million dollars or one. We and we also get we already as as town meeting members, as residents of the town, support recreation through our tax dollars. That I included that in one of the slides. And then we, well, Mark, uh, Mark, I think we're debating the article. We're now. debating the article. We're not debating it. So I'm going to allow. Uh, there's two individuals have their hand. I think uh, Susan Lewis, yeah. her hand up. I think it's a mistake. Susan, uh, you had your hand up. Is that? Do you want to speak, or is that one a mistake? Good evening, Susan. We also have an audience member with a hand up. Yeah. Susan? It's a mistake. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay, Susan. No worries. Uh, let me admit. Um, Lisa Pargoli, and then, Jen, sir, if you want to come up and speak as well, you can. Lisa, I've admitted you. 
Hi, thank you, Lisa Pagoli, Precinct 4 Town Meeting Member. Um, I find evening. it very disheartening listening to this conversation, how you give important time you a hard time for doing something so great that's been going on for, for the resident, all residents for 33 years, from small little fee or not, just a common courtesy, but we'll throw millions at the school buildings for uh, their mistakes and cost overruns. I mean, this is very disheartening, um, the way you people conduct business and you treat the residents. Sorry, well, thank, thank you. Thank you for that, Lisa. No, I mean, look, I think, I think the Pace and Park Music Festival does great work. I mean, I mean, the fact that this is a broad application to all, all of these 501c3 organizations, it's really difficult for me to support this. And I would ask Tommy to look for ways to sort of raise, fun, raise fundraising fees. Sir, did you have your uh, hand up? Mark, did you, want you to speak? did in fact. Mark, you did. I paid last year, I know. Did you have your hand up, Jen, sir, sir? Come on up and speak. Yeah, we're not looking for speeches, but if you want to uh, identify yourself, please. And uh, um, I know you've been waiting patiently. Thank you for that. Good evening, Antonio Marley, Precinct 6 resident. Oh, good evening. How are you? Nice to see you tonight. I'm good. Nice to see you as well. Warm yeah. quote. As a resident of Precinct 6, I can say that the, music, the Pace and Park Music Festival is a central part of the civic and social life of the district. It's been a valued community event for over 35 years. A good friend of mine has been going since the music festival began and has brought many friends to the event over the years. She wanted me to emphasize how integral the festival is to the fabric of the community and its residents. Events like this are what make, are what make Belmont a cohesive interconnected community. It is essential that local volunteer-led Belmont organizations are able to organize and put on events like the Pace and Park Music Festival. It is, essentially criti it, it is especially critical that they're able to do this regardless of size or financial bandwidth. This language is narrow enough that in my view, the benefits will be limited to free, public and locally organized events. The language limiting the benefits to groups only holding events open to the public potentially limits groups requiring tickets, therefore vastly narrowing the number of groups that can benefit from this amendment, therefore making the cost very reasonable to the town. Based on all these reasons, I therefore ask the select board to support the amendment to general bylaw 40-325E fees for special events permits in the use of the park sites Select board can also expect a follow-up email supporting the amendment as a select before it's time. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I appreciate your uh, input. Uh, okay, before we vote on this, Tommy, what's the total fee that you're being charged? Well, I don't know what they're going to change it to, but at the oh, moment... they're not changing it. What's the fee for 2022 that hasn't been paid yet? How much was that? $35 for two oh. hours for each concert, multiplied time. So I get penalized for 12 how many? concerts. So it's, a, it's near a thousand bucks. Plus, I haven't included the kitty concert. No, no, Tommy, that's not a thousand dollars. So she's saying seventy dollars. She said thirty-five, two hours, twelve. So it would be seventy times twelve. Is it seventy plus times twelve? Four, plus so another eight hundred forty dollars. No, hang on. I'm, I'm confused. Is it thirty-five dollars for two hours? No, plus seventy dollars. Seventy for two hours. Thirty-five per hour. Seventy. Oh, for thirty-five two per hour. Okay. So. I thought it was. So it's eight hundred forty dollars. If it's seventy per uh, event and yeah. twelve events, it's eight hundred forty dollars. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, look, I think. Hey, I just support. asked Mark. You, you say you think it's very easy to raise money. I've worked pretty hard to raise money, well, and I can I tell you, during the pandemic, it was very difficult to raise money. So what you're saying to me is that I should raise money specifically to pay the rec department for use of a park that the town already pays for. That well, you, and, you and the other 361 501c3 organizations, Tommy. So, I mean, to single out sort of, this article is specific. You made the point that it's for Pace and Park News for us. I can't support that for just one organization because you what you've done through this article, unfortunately, is you've wrapped in the other 361 organizations in town, uh, which include Belmont Hill School, Belmont Day School, and some other, you know, pretty substantive 501c3 organizations. And frankly, um, I think that they should pay for use of our parks when they have a special event. Sorry. Especially There's since nothing, those... There's nothing those... against Pacing Park Music Festival. This is not a, this is not a debate I understand, on Mark, the but... merits and the wonderful work that's been done and you and others on for the Pacing Park Music Festival. This is a, an article that exempts every 501c3 organization in town from paying a fee, and I just cannot support that. I'm sorry. And I think there's I think other ways that, to raise I these think, funds. I, I think that you're missing a point, though. You mentioned Belmont Hill School. They don't pay payment in lieu of taxes. They don't pay taxes. Yeah, we're, we're know, digressing here, Tommy. We're getting off the subject here. So, um, Mark, unfortunately... it, it's very, it's very disheartening to hear that you're lumping a very tiny organization. No, you you did no, you did that, Tommy. You did that through no. this article. I didn't lump them in. You do that through this article. 
you've lumped those organizations in by, by this citizen's petition. You, that's the point here that you did that by the citizen's petition to bring them in. I'm not comparing Pace of Mark Music Festival to the substantive 501c3 organization Belmont Hill School. I get that point. But your article, the citizen petition lumps them into this, meaning that, and I'm not picking free. on Belmont Hill School, I'm picking on those organizations that have the financial wherewithal to pay this very modest fee if they decide to rent, um, have events at our parks, which I think they should. But this article brings that into it. I, I just cannot support that. I think there's other ways that we can find to support Payson Park Music Festival without having a broad application of no fees for any 501c3 organization in Belmont now and into the future. So with that, I, I, I cannot vote for this and I would recommend for unfavorable action. I move unfavorable, that we vote unfavorable action. What's the, what's the form of the motion that we need? Uh, I move that the select board recommend unfavorable action. I move that the select board recommend unfavorable action on article eight, which article are we on? Article eight. eight. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Tommy. Appreciate it. I'll have a chance at Tom meeting to debate this further. All right, so authorizing 10-year terms for town leases and procurement contracts for electric vehicles, buses, and trucks. Uh, we have the uh, petitioner here. Yes, good evening. And there's two, right? Are you doing both? No, just the first. Just the first one? Okay. Please identify yourself. I don't know if you want me to, I can just talk. Um, I think we've seen the presentation. The presentation. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty yeah, straightforward. I'm in favor of this, but go ahead. If you want to just comment, oh, I, identify I, I, yourself. Yeah. Brian Copperell, member of the Energy Committee, Precinct 6. Thank you for having me. I see you all. Nice to see you again. Um, so uh, electric vehicle, buses, trucks, uh, especially the large capital intensive ones, they cost more up front, but they add efficiencies over time, less maintenance. Um, if you spread those costs over 10 years, they are competitive with diesel. This uh, warrant article uh, addresses the state law, procurement law, which only allows three-year municipal contracts unless uh, town meeting extends. And so we're asking for permission for the town, support this, right? Yeah. school district, and otherwise uh, DPW, et cetera, to uh, enter into longer-term procurement, whether that's a subscription, a rental. We would definitely want to make sure that it includes the school bus contracts. If it's a service contract, that's another form of procurement. Um, so any of those would be up to 10 years. And again, critically, there's no mandate that the town go electric, but it gives the town the flexibility to do so. so yeah, that, that was my sense. Unless I'm missing something in reading the article, you had worded it very carefully to, to give us a lot of flexibility. I think it makes a lot of sense. So thank you for being very careful. And, and when you and I spoke about it, Elizabeth, um, you had said, well, I really want you to make sure the numbers work, right? Yeah. And make those assumptions really explicit. And I my respectful response is, we don't need to get to that. This yeah. does not say, oh, a particular proposal is in front of us. Um, that's for an RFP down the road. Um, and so for that to be resolved at that point, let them let them compete. And if yeah. they don't compete, then the school district or the DPW can say, no, thank you. I am all in favor of multiple options. So I, I think it's, uh, it's sound. Questions? Uh, so just to be, first off, has the school committee oh, or the school of Meeting them tomorrow. Okay. We have met them earlier. They didn't take a vote because it was premature relative to last year's. I think the Warren Committee is voting on Wednesday night on these articles, right? Yeah. This makes I mean, abundant sense to me. Go ahead, Roy. I'm sorry. I mean, it seems uh, it seems to provide an option. Uh, it's not clear what the option value is, but it provides an option. There's no obligation to uh, use an EV vehicle, but it. it potentially creates it as a possibility that didn't exist before. So, yeah, I mean, that, that seems fine. Great. So we have a motion to recommend favorable action in Article 9. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. Welcome. Right. Article 10. <coughs> oh, of course. Roger. How are you? Come on up. I thought we were deferring this. No, I, we had a meeting last week with Roger to talk about what we could talk about here tonight. Yeah, okay, that's fine. About what we've done in terms of trying to understand the impact of this article. Now we got, I got an email from, um, I think, Marty Bittner, um, Marty, and, and on the cost to the library with yep. no additional costs. We that's true, that so we ran that one down. But uh, is there additional information? No, go ahead, why don't you go ahead. So I think, you know, the conversations I have with Roger, um, what we're trying to do from the, from the town's perspective, what I'm trying to do is understand the impact of an opt-in. Right now, we're currently under the stretch code 
um, that will continue as of January 1st. The opt-in is an above and beyond the stretch code. So I'm trying to understand what those impacts to the town would be. We ha haven't figured out, and we are working on this, what the impact is on Office of Community Development in terms of exceptional services. I've been speaking with Ara. Roger had a meeting with myself and Ara to understand what the impacts on Ara's work in interpreting the new code and how that applies. Uh, impacts on any potential revenue in the future in terms of new growth. Does it, is it going to impact the number of new buildings that we see per year? There's a little bit of discrepancy in terms of the number of buildings, which we need, need to nail down. Um, and then finally, the impact on the rink that's coming up and any um, of the affordable housing things that we see. This is just really, it's a timing issue at this point and whether or not town meeting and the board's going to have enough information to take action on this um, article with all the information and right now I don't have it. Uh, one of the things we talked about at the warrant committee was reaching out to the other communities that either are about to vote this at town meeting or just did. Um, that work has to be done as well. So there's a lot of, of um, running down of information so we can give town meeting and the boards um, the accurate information it needs to understand the impact of what opt-in really means. Well, so, and I have to say, I am confused by the wording of the warrant article because the, um, the sort of enhanced uh, stretch code comes into effect anyway, right? That, that, will, mm -hmm. be, that will come into effect January 1st. That's right. And that does not require any. Excuse me. What will come into effect on January 1st? Roger, please identify yourself. Oh, Roger Rubel, Precinct 5, town meeting member. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Sorry, could, so again, this point. is a lot of the information I'm still trying to gather and understand. My understanding is we're currently under a stretch code as of January 1st. There is another stretch code that comes into um, code that we have to implement. <laughs> that, that, that's for July 1st, 2024. What's the January 1st, 2024 date? What is that? Is that what you're referring if to? We, uh, um, the article um, that I've put forward says that if we adopt the specialized code, it would go into effect on January 1st, 2000. Well, let, let me back up for a second then. There, there is a, <laughs> let's call it a next generation stretch code, which I had thought was coming into effect January 1st, but Roger, you're saying it actually comes into effect on July 1st, 2024? Yeah, I'm not sure quite what you're referring to, but, but the, well, a, just because I, I'll tell you the reason I ask is because um, I, um, my understanding up to this point is that there was a new, a next, a new version of the stretch code, but then Separately, on top of that, there's an opt-in as a separate feature. Yes, that's and is that correct? correct? Yes. Okay. And at least up to now, up to this moment, I thought that the new generation of the stretch code was coming into effect sometime in 2024. That's correct. Okay, and that comes into effect by state law. The town town meeting doesn't decide that. The select board doesn't decide that. That just comes into effect. Correct. So the only thing that's, it sounds like there are two things on the table. One is it sounds like your warrant article is moving up the date in which the new stretch code uh, takes effect. Yes. And then embedded in that is also adoption of the opt-in. And the reason I ask is because opt-in doesn't seem to appear in the warrant article. Um. I'm totally confused now, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, <laughs> it, it is. It is sometimes referred to as the opt-in specialized energy code. Other times, it's referred to as the specialized energy code. I'm not sure what wording I use. Oh, okay. Oh, but but the specialized energy code is then a separate set of provisions from the enhanced. It, stretch code that's coming into effect anyway. The opt-in specialized energy code encompasses the stretch code. And in addition to that, there's a couple of other regulations or requirements. Oh, okay, so, so it, it's specialized energy code then is a, is a package of the enhanced stretch code plus what we've been calling the opt-in provisions. Yes. Okay. It's hard to understand. Well, there, yeah, well, I'm I, I didn't write so, um, no, and I know your presentation was helpful to clarify. I don't have it in front of me tonight, so. Yeah. Um, okay, well, at least I think 
that's some progress. And I, I have to say, I share. <laughs> and whose mind? Uh, I, I, I share the concerns generally outlined by Patrice. Uh, not that I or maybe anybody is really against stretch code, but uh, it's placing a new set of enforcement responsibilities on really one person in this town who, as far as I can tell, is already underwater. And the, the, the implicate, the, to do this properly uh, is an unknown, uh, it's a set of tasks of unknown complexity right now. And which raises concerns both of his, the, the human possibility of increasing the workload plus even for applicants, I don't know that we're even in a position now to give them either clear guidance or, or prompt uh, response to an application uh, to, to deal with this uh, in the very near future and to have it effective January 20, in January 2024 gives me a lot of concern. Yeah, I guess my question would be if, if we're looking at a January 1 implementation date, I'd be a whole lot more comfortable if we had some more discussion and some more clarity. And it feels to me like we've got two other decision points where we could do this. This could be segment B of town meeting. There is going to be a special town meeting in the fall. Um, I would just be a lot more comfortable if I had more certainty. Um, you know, we've, we've met, we've discussed. Um, one of the things that I'm very anxious and eager for is frankly increased mixed use, um, increased density and development. I don't want to scare off developers if we can't tell them what it is that we're asking them to do. And I think everybody agrees the town needs it, certainly from a financial perspective, but also because it's the right thing to do to create these, these mixed use neighborhoods and MBTA communities. So I think we're all headed toward the same goal. Right. And I guess the question is, um, this has been happening a lot with climate change issues. We're heading towards the same goal, but we're not heading there very fast. Mm -hmm. And we're not heading there fast enough. So from my perspective, I want the town to be bold. And I want the town to start taking action on this. And this is an opportunity to do that. Eight other communities around us have already adopted this. So if they're not going to come to Belmont to do development, they're not coming to Lexington. They're not coming to Boston. They're not coming to Watertown. They're not coming to Newton. Can I just point out though, Roger, that, that those towns that you did just mention have staff, robust staff um, in their um, Office of Community Development. And, and every town that I talk to about this says, when I tell them what the problem is in Belmont, they say, we have the same problem. We have trouble hiring people. We have people leaving who have not come back. When, can you please join us? So, Roger, uh, to your comment, I agree we need to sort of com continue to commit ourselves to our climate action roadmap. We're behind. We're clearly behind. But I think what you're hearing from my colleagues is that, and I think what you're going to hear at town meeting, you're probably going to hear from the Warren Committee, and perhaps that's fine, is some questions about our ability to enforce, some questions about the impact it might have on, de on development in town. And I could find myself supporting this, but I think there are some unanswered questions that I think my colleagues have expressed concern about that I share. And if the effective date is January 1st, 24, does it hurt us to wait until segment B or, or the fall time meeting? I don't know whether that's too close to implementation date, but I'll recognize Glenn Clancy, Director of Community Development. Glenn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Glenn Clancy, Director of Community Development. I just wanted to clarify a couple of points. So Belmont is a stretch of energy. Uh, community. We adopted 10 years ago. Oh, that's correct. 2011. 2011. Yeah, many years ago. Uh, so by virtue of the adoption of the stretch energy code, any new iteration, we automatically uh, capture that. The current... What does that, step back on that. What does that mean? It means that as the state and the national building codes, as, as uh, they pertain to energy efficiency. Did they change the stretch energy code that's sort of built into our agreement here? That's correct. Okay. So it, it, as with any building code, when a code changes, we We're automatically opt it automatically in. Right, I got it. Okay, got stretch it. energy back in 2011 was 
um, a more robust energy code that the town had the ability to opt into. We did that. By virtue of that, every stretch energy code iteration that comes out uh, after now in perpetuity, we grab that. The effective date for the new stretch energy was January 1st of 23. That's the stretch energy code. That's for residential. The commercial piece of the stretch energy code is effective July 1st of 23. Uh, Patrice was right when she, she was trying to explain. The, the opt-in provision, which is, which is above and beyond stretch energy requirement, that is the one that Roger is proposing uh, be adopted in July of 24. But stretch energy is already effective. No, January 24th of 24. <laughs> January 24. But stretch energy is already effective on the residential level. I can tell you right now that we have an application for new residential construction that we are trying to do a plan review on for stretch energy because we are still on a learning curve to try to figure out just exactly what that new code means. Uh, Patrice tried to allude to this. I'll, I'll flesh this out a little bit more. We've contacted some of the communities that have already adopted. Um, some of them are struggling. They, they don't know how to implement the opt-in that, that their communities have approved. We, we also know that at the state level, they are continuing to do things like introduce definitions, the terminology that wasn't clearly defined originally. Under the stretch um, energy code? Uh, no, under the enhanced, the opt-in version. Okay, got it. Okay, and so one of the reasons why I think we're advocating for us taking a step back here and deferring to the fall, um, probably at the earliest at this point, is we're trying to see how this plays out in the other communities, what the level of effort is for them to uh, implement this. They, they're, some of these communities, and I say some because ours is the one really who did all the legwork on this. Um, I sat in on a couple of meetings with Ara and Patrice, but I, I would not profess to be complete with all the information that Ara has gathered. But what I have been able to learn from his conversations with Patrice is that these communities, they're struggling right now. They, they don't know um, exactly how to implement, what the impact is on certain projects. They're waiting for guidance. They're waiting to see how these things play out. Um, I think there would be a benefit to the town um, to let this play out in some other communities so that we can learn from them and their experience. Um, Roger, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think that at the end of the day, when you get enough communities that jump on board with this, a developer's not going to say, well, I, I, all of a sudden I can't build within the 128 belt. That's not possible anymore. I'm not necessarily concerned about the impact on development, although I think that could be real. My primary focus right now and concern is what it means at the staff level and, and, and right. our ability to process. Well, well the effective date is January 1st, 24th. So let me ask you this question. If we wait until a fall time meeting, it's up to petition to decide whether that's the case. Um, and, he, and let's say it's adopted, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is that sufficient enough time? I mean, and we start have this sort of learning, you know, go through a process of learning and understanding what the opt-ins, but you know, the, the higher sort of stretch code as I look at it, as you defined it here. And I remember the slides you prepared were helpful, Roger, to understand what the difference is between the enhanced, this stretch code, the stretch code we're currently under and this opt-in enhanced stretch code. If we decide to, you know, as a temp community, support this in the fall, thinking like we have time to sort of understand what that might mean. And it's effective January 1st, 24. Is that sufficient enough time for developers to understand what their requirements are? Um, I think it is because a lot of the surrounding communities have already adopted. Okay. Um, but, but bear in mind, if we take this issue up spring town meeting for, for a January 1st adoption, or we take it up at a special fall town meeting for January 1st, the adoption date obviously is the same. Yeah. But, but there's a couple of things that benefit us here. One is our ability to look at other communities, their experience, and to learn from that. Right. The other thing is to have the, the, the sufficient answers for town meeting that are inevitably going to come. That, that right, right now, we you can't don't answer. have the answers right. to those questions. Um, sure. And uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to come across as... Are there any comments on that? Yeah. So um, Glenn is extremely busy. Ara is extremely busy. Patrice is extremely busy. I am not very busy. I'm retired. And what I've been focusing on is the specialized energy code. If you ask me the questions, I likely am able yeah, to but answer them. And if I can't answer them, I can ask DOE. But, but you're, not, you're not enforcing it, Roger. That's the point. Our staff needs to enforce you it. You know what we're enforcing. I mean, well, that's the point he, Glenn's making, is that that's what we don't understand. So here, here's, the, here's our... But I, but I, I, I can't... It, 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 let me just give you an example. Under the specialized energy code, if you build a building which is all electric, except for a couple of exceptions, yeah. it's the same as the stretch code. 
There's no additional. I don't think we're debating the merits of the. No, no, no. I wasn't. I'm debating how much work it's going to take. Yeah, and so the point I'm, I think we're making, and what you're hearing from the select board, and I think you can hear from the Warren Committee and others, is no. need additional information committed to our climate action roadmap. You've heard me say that before, Roger. But right now, I'm not prepared to vote favorable action on this at all. Roger, I really don't want to vote. I would, it would really help me out a lot, and it's up to you if we could postpone this. Yeah, I'm not willing to commit to postponing. Okay, once you think about that, we're not going to take a vote on this tonight, so um, once you think about that and perhaps... Because I, I don't want to vote If you do move forward, yeah. we're going to have to take a position on this. And, I understand. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we want to work with you on this, and I think, yeah. I think you will find support well, from the select board if we defer this to the got fall. Got it. Yeah, I just wanted, if I could just... Yeah, could, could you please get, identify yourself and speak? Yeah. Uh, Cavill Eames, um, Precinct 6. So I worked on this at the state level. Um, so I, I understand the, the whole, the issues that are there. The stretch code, the new stretch code, okay? So it's like the stretch, stretch code. So think about it like in the stretch yeah. code. Right, okay. Still has a fossil fuel pathway. It, it does. And on the advocate side, they were very upset about that. There is still a fossil fuel pathway. There are more than, I believe there are at least um, 14 communities. There are 10 that have a pilot program that was in the state law that has nothing to do with the opt-in. It's just all new buildings are going to be fossil fuel free. The opt-in stretch code is completely separate from that. That's what Watertown's done. That's what um, Cambridge, Somerville, Cambridge, Boston. Somerville, Boston, like that's, that's what they're all doing. And so what this is going to create is a bulk option for developers when they are purchasing this all electric equipment. There's also state legislation that's going to do it statewide. So, you know, we have climate goals. We passed two pretty comprehensive climate laws this last, this past year. The, the one that goes until 2030, that's 50%. Um, to, our, to, to reach our climate goals of, of zero emissions. Mm -hmm. That's all for residential and transportation. The 2030 to 2050 looks at the really hard stuff, like the substations, you know, airplanes, like the really hard stuff. But the residential, the building, all of that is like the, the first half. So I, I know that we don't want to vote tonight, but I do just want to offer up any kind of support that I can give and help. Well, I think additional information might be, because I yeah. think a lot of folks any have questions. Any yeah. additional information you can provide. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I see us moving to, I mean, I can find myself supporting this in a fall yeah, town yeah. meeting, but I think I'm taking into consideration the comments from our town administrator and our director yeah. of development. Appreciate off, uh, Roger, your offer to yeah, uh, provide additional comments and, and feedback. Uh, you're, the, you're the petitioner here. You can move forward with this. One of the ways I feel is that by thank you very much. By the way, I appreciate that. Presenting it at spring, I'll be quite honest about it. Presenting it at spring town meeting will be, give me an opportunity to make a presentation. Well, to, me. All, to all of town meeting, town meeting can decide what they want to do, and if they decide that they don't want to do this, I can then bring it back in the fall. Well, I mean, so let me offer this up to you, and we, we need to move. We need to move on. Our moderator is on tonight, listening. You can still do that and make a presentation on this and withdraw the article or defer it to the fall town meeting. So I'm not speaking for the moderator. I'm not in charge of town meeting. Um, Mike is. Um, you still might have an opportunity to say what this is all about and why we as a community. Look, Roger, we need to commit ourselves. I agree. We're behind. Yeah. Not only in this community, but in, the, in this country, mm -hmm. way behind. And so we need to continue to commit ourselves to our climate action roadmap. I think what you're hearing is that we have questions about enforcement. We have questions about t terminology. We have questions about staffing. Should not defer us from supporting this, but giving us additional time to run down some of the answers to those questions um, and bringing this back up in the fall um, where you have an opportunity and it's up to the moderator to decide whether he wants to do this or not, to present this and withdraw it to a future town meeting, I think it might be a better course of action. Okay, I'll, I'll talk to Mike. Talk to Mike, yeah. All right. Thank you, Roger. Appreciate Thank you coming. Thank you very much for your input. Appreciate that. Why don't we roll through these other articles quickly because um, we, we're behind, of course. Article 2, authorization to represent the town's legal interest. Do I have a motion to recommend favorable action? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Glenn, join us on this easement issue, please. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Yep. Doing this in five and... Uh, special town meetings next. So oh, yeah. And we did the FCPA article. Okay, 
So just the rank. Yeah, yeah, actually, Adam. You did it before I was. Yeah, I, yeah, right. I was there that night. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Right. So. So Glenn, uh, you have a big map here, huh? Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Glenn, I'm sorry. I apologize. We're we're just behind. I thank you for coming. I, Mr. Chair, Glenn Clancy, Director of Delayed, uh, clearly on the two issues you just heard, but particularly the traffic one. Go ahead, Glenn. Can you guess who I am? No, I know who you are. Go ahead. I'm Glenn for the third time. Going to show us this map. I'm uh, I'm Glenn Clancy, Director of Community Development. Mr. Chair, members of the board, the uh, City Side Subaru on Pleasant Street received approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board to reconstruct their facilities. Um, okay. The new facility will fall on three different parcels and take the place of three existing buildings out there. There are two existing utility easements that take utilities off of Pleasant Street out to the back along the railroad. Those uh, easements will be impacted by the new construction. So as a result, the utilities have to be rerouted. New easements have to be created. A plan has been prepared. Select board has to, the, the town meeting article is going to authorize the select board. This is our article? This is. Well, yes, it is. Your All right. right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and so the process requires uh, town meeting to um, authorize the select board to take the easement. The plan represents the easement. I will be uh, presenting at town meeting the information. Um, this this affects stormwater and uh, water. So is that what the huge equipment and massive pipes are? So there's a lot of site work that is uh, that is going on at the moment, um, and a lot of it is uh, the result of rerouted stormwater and water uh, that used to go straight through from Pleasant Street. They now have to go around. Mm -hmm. So they're going around the back. That's what I thought I saw from the map. Yeah, that's right. Glenn is Subaru doing the work at their expense, or is that a town expense? Uh, Roy, the uh, Subaru is paying for this entire effort. They have prepared the cert. They paid for survey, the uh, pre preparation of the plan. They will pay to file any documents of the registry of deeds. Um, the only real effort on our part is my work to uh, to bring it tonight and to present it to Tom Meade. My global comment is there a great business in town. We should do anything we can to foster great businesses in town. They I mean, certainly have a successful dealership down on Pleasant Street. So. Well, I would say reserve the first part here. Yeah. All right, so we have to okay. recommend. So we're we recommending our article. So do we recommend table action? Do they have to approve the plan, Glenn? Pardon me? Do they have to vote to approve the plan? Um, no, I think it's just the article. But the plan is um, sort of accessory to the article. It's, it's uh, you may spend some time in this plan. It's not that it's confusing, but it likely could be confusing. I have a motion to recommend favorable our, um, action on All in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Oh. If you don't mind putting it. I like these plans that we sign like this. Take the line above. This plan uh, is filed in the town clerk's office for anyone who wants to view it. Okay. And, uh, Thank you. After town meeting, uh, assuming town meeting votes to approve, and the select board signed off on these documents, it will be filed with the registry. Okay. Thank you, Glenn, for hanging in there. I'll take a very helpful explanation. For everything you do. On the citizen petition. Okay. Um, we have one final, well, two final articles to consider. Uh, the revolving fund for recreation. I mean, are there any questions on that? Uh, none. Uh, we need to do it. So I move. Right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Move favorable action on article, or no, move that we recommend favorable action on article five. Five, thank you. So, so just to be clear uh, before seconding, um, creation of the revolving fund uh, does not preclude subsequent creation of an enterprise fund. This is this, this, yeah. this an interim step. So yeah, this is we're looking at it as a, a an interim step, a beginning process to see how it works. Yeah. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then um, Let's see, that's everything except for a uh, special time meeting article. Article one. Article one. Are there any questions on this, folks? No. I think some questions will come up about additional fundraising. Do you want to comment on that at all, Patrice? Or? Um, I believe in the warrant and the way it's written. Okay. We have it very similar to how we established the library. No different than what we did, right? On the library, right? Mm -hmm. article. So within the within the summary of, of the article and the warrant and the special town meeting warrant, we indicate that any additional fundraising would go to offset 
the. But are we all comfortable with that? Uh, I actually have a question, a concern. I mean, what's their incentive to um, do additional fundraising? Then? Well, that's a commitment they made to the community, right? To the extent that, they, that what, what we heard, at least what I heard, and yeah. I think others as well, that they said that once, um, you know, there's a affirmative vote by, by the town that a number of sort of uh, corporate institutions might move forward with, with naming rights. So we hope that they but move I, forward with that. To say, I, I didn't understand how additional fundraising to increase the cost of the project would work because as uh, Mark Haley explained, they're going to be specking out and bidding different phases of this project. And if somebody comes along in August and says, by the way, I want to buy a better system X after uh, the system has already been designed, I don't understand how it works. Do you go back and redesign? So are we just assuming that additional fundraising won't happen? Or well, even if it did happen, I don't see how you use the money to alter a design that has already been finalized. Be a change order. That's what Mark has said. Be a series of change orders that... Uh, uh, change orders by their nature are expensive and slow things down. And I, I just think it's, it actually becomes a risk for the project. And unless we're talking about a gigantic sum of money, if somebody was coming along with $5 million, that might be a different story. Yeah. I'm, yeah. And I'm stepping late into this process and I don't want to spend a ton of time or gum this up. I was just thinking, could you work out a system where it was a 50, 50 split or something? So there was still motivation to fundraise, but, but, but it sounds are, like it's I mean, impractical. But the, the amounts are unknown. And in the okay. meanwhile, the, the planning has to be. Exactly so, so the same I, article we have for the library now, to the extent that the library did, They had done a lot funds. of fundraising. They'd done, they'd done if, if, you, yeah. Yeah. if you saw the presentations, it's a complicated question because we've been asked the same question by those folks involved in fundraising. Yeah. Why would we continue to fundraise? And the point that I made is that that's the commitment we made to the community. Mm -hmm. We made a commitment to the community that to the extent that we have an affirmative vote, we believe that there are corporate sponsors that are out there that will come forward and decide to commit to a donation for uh, some kind of naming rights. So I would, to I me, would love to that. use those funds to increase the cost of this building is mm -hmm. not, not appropriate. But, uh, it is true that the library uh, had a much longer period to fundraise before uh, the, right. the amount was finalized. I think here, and, and I don't know what flexibility remains in the system, but <clears throat> if somebody came along after the building was built and said, by the way, we would like to provide this amenity or that amenity, sure. that, that is a separate discrete. Okay. Want to buy a new that, Zamboni that, for us or yeah. other that things could, or redo that could the be floor? As yeah. I said, I don't, I don't want to turn this into a huge discussion, so I'm fine um, supporting the article as, as yeah, written, good. just as long as we understand that there may not be significant fundraising that happens. There may not be. For, for, the, for the construction phase of the yeah, building. The Although there was commitments that were there. And by the way, to the extent there are any naming rights opportunities, uh, we as a select board get to decide whether we accept those or not. Set points on us. Right. Very good. Uh, All right, so please, do I have a motion to recommend please. favorable action on uh, special town meeting article one? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is that it? That's it. All right, Mr. Carmen. Again, oh, I'll... unless some come through, but we'll bring those to you. When are amendments due by? I think Wednesday. Three days before, yeah. Yeah. I think Wednesday. Good evening, Floyd. How are you? Not too bad, Mike. Yourself? Good to see you again. Thanks for coming in and apologize for our de significant delay here. We're an hour. Um, so um, we did receive um, information from the chair of the retirement board this morning, um, a memo, two memos. Perhaps you want to just sort of explain what took place. Wasn't able to attend. All right. So just for the viewing audience, my, my name is Floyd Kahn and I'm a member of the Belmont Retirement Board. So we had a meeting this morning with uh, the retirement board and Kathy Riley, Kathy presented a series of options um, to move uh, the funding schedule. We also were smart enough to make sure that we had John Borak, who was the chief actuary for Perak, who has the final say. Oh, he attended the meeting? We had him at the oh, meeting. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And he has the final say. <laughs> So basically, Kathy gave us three options. John Borak came right out and said, I'm only going to support option one and two. I'm not going to support three. He also said that he was in favor of option one. Now, 
Option, uh, alternative option one? Right. Okay, yep. So after probably about 10 minutes worth of discussion back and forth, we came to an agreement with John Borak that we were in favor of option two. The difference between option one and option two, option one is roughly a $230,000, uh, I don't wanna call it a reduction, but a change in a funding for 2024, as opposed to 563,000. 24. Or 24. <clears throat> so as I said, we probably were back and forth for a good 10 minutes and uh, came to this agreement to go with option two. Kathy Riley reminded us that we're gonna have another valuation. Next year. January 1st. Yeah. So, it's, well, it's not January 1st. You're going to start out using January 1st as your starting point. You're probably not going to get that report much before. No, the evaluation point in time. March, April, May. Right, now I get March, that. April, May. <clears throat> so, what we're talking about now is at this point in time, but that valuation, who knows how that's going to come out. I want to make that point very clear, and that's what Kathy was trying to make sure that we understood that there's still a lot of factors when you get into doing pension valuations. So it boils down to, in the, in the report that uh, Tom sent you, <clears throat> it's either option one or option two as a board, and we, let's say we got John Borak's approval for option two. I don't think he was sold on option two, but he didn't do a lot of pushback. But but the, the, the change, the dramatic, the, the more significant change, right, is that right. About five funding, schedule, yeah. the funding schedule was extended by two years? Yeah, it was, it was extended to 2031. Wait a second. No. I'm not understanding that. Extend if you read if you read the. I thought it was to 2023. If you read, if you read the report, yeah, I, I saw that. Extend it one year. I saw that in there, but it was extended to 2031, and that's that's the best we could do. So how many? So it didn't extend it at all. Well, they had shortened it, it to 2030, so it's back. 29 to 31. Yep. Oh, for, for 29 to 31. So let's play Okay. And let me just. Uh, I think there's something else in the letter from Siegel that's worth pointing out, which is there's been a lot of talk by <clears throat> different people in town about how the funding schedule should be extended to some more distant point in the future. And I think the letter right now uh, says that a lot of that discussion is actually moot because under the way the uh, PERAC rules work, her letter says under any scenario right now, you can't extend the schedule beyond 2032. So talk about 2033, 34, 35 is really off the table. Right. Uh, it's, it's, off, it's off the table now. Off the table now, right. So an, an extension beyond, so that point, that's point number one. Point number two, I actually would vote for option one myself. And uh, it's not clear to me that the uh, retirement board, uh, I don't know why they would prefer option two over option one when option one accelerates a little bit, but let me say why I'm not sure that distinction actually matters in the end, because the, the funding such schedule sets a floor on payments, but there's nothing to prevent the town from accelerating a given payment schedule. And even if option two were adopted by the retirement board, I would still urge the select board to appropriate an amount that would fund as if option one were in effect. So that, even though well, the savings well, is significant. Yeah, get, no, there's sig no, the sig yeah. the save well, look at the end. The, you know, well, no, I understand, but 24 savings is 563 versus yeah, 230. Yeah, but it, look it at the- eases our option. No, but look at look in the last year. If you look in- No, I in, see, in, I answer, in, I, in 2031. I see that. Right. It, it's, it's a $5 million delta. And because the town has this unfortunate history of kicking cans down the road, I would actually urge 
option one, which provides most of the relief, the incremental relief of switching to option two as compared to option one is kind of marginal. Uh, and it, it also gives you a cushion since, as you say, when you do the, the valuation for 2022, it sounds like we're in a favorable position now because market returns were pretty good the last couple of years. But in case there is a kind of a return to a normalcy, let's say, and there's uh, an experience of a inferior returns in the next couple of years, when, you, when you're on option one, it actually gives you more of a cushion against the downside than option two. And I, I would think that's the prudent course. But if I look at 25, because we don't guarantee we have a successful override. Yeah. Just the savings, savings are, I understand your points, yeah. but the savings in 25 are even more dramatic between it's, one it's, and two. It's about half a million dollars. Yeah, it's a lot, yeah. depending on whether an override is successful. Uh, how many, Do we have a vote on this funding or this is the retirement board's <laughs> recommendation to us in terms of how we fund? So the retirement board voted on option two. two. No, right. Option it, two. So I'm, I'm the sorry. reason we voted on option two is the last time we met here, you we heard about 24th budget. That's right. So we were dealing with what is the best option for 24 funding. Yeah. yeah. Option two is your best. And then can I ask a yeah, it's, Let me I, finish one. Go ahead. Yeah. You have another actuarial pension actuarial valuation coming up in calendar year 24, you don't know what that's going to come out. Um, okay. And then just for clarity purposes, because the schedule is confusing a little bit to me, at least the today's funding schedule is through 29, correct? 30. It's right here. 30. The unfunded, the unfunded liability current schedule is but we've extended only one year here? Yes. Well, have we extended it for only one year? Because that's all Paracol. That's all Paracol. That's all John yeah. Borak would allow. So I, I'm inclined yeah. to support two. First of all, thank yeah. you for doing what we asked you to do, which was to go back and look at this, because we are worried about a budget crunch next year. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm inclined to support schedule number two, understanding there's going to be a new actuarial valuation. Anyway, this, this could all change, but it gives us what we asked for, which is some breathing room next year. 24 will not change. But but 25, potentially. Right. What do you mean 24 doesn't change? Help me understand that. What's 24's payment it doesn't change? The what? valuation won't. No, oh, no, I get that. All right, yeah, okay, yeah. But, but look at what option two is doing. You know, the, the concern a couple of years ago when the Schedule was derived based on a 4.45% increase. The, the, the focus then was uh, what was a sustainable year over year increase rate? The 4.45 was deemed sustainable, even though it exceeded, exceeded the natural growth of revenues. If you look at option two, it's actually freezing the contribution for several years at zero, even when our revenue is growing. So I, uh, the beauty of option even option one is conservative because it's it's baking in a two and a half percent increase every year when, when we know that revenues actually do increase by more than two and a half. So to option two, I just find uh, excessively backloading because it, remember every dollar that you don't uh, by every dollar that you don't um, reduce the liability today, you're, you're effectively paying interest in the future. And this is telling you that it's a couple of million dollars in 2031. So understood. I think we're all hoping for a successful override next year. If there's not a successful override, we're in severe trouble. And so I, I feel to me like the conservative approach is actually um, to see what happens with the override next year. And then we can always, as you said, it doesn't stop us from increasing the funding. If we have a successful override, we can fund more. Exactly. But if we, until we have a successful yeah, override, I'm, I'm I am sure. feeling really conservative on this. Okay. Let me just, uh, I don't know, is Kathy Riley joined here tonight? No, she's not. So uh, what's confusing me is, uh, and maybe I'm just being too serious, this current funding schedule takes me through 31. Is that not correct? Well, 
Uh, the, the, yeah. This shows it's 33. Right, because the, the unfunded... The the unfunded to, the to just normal funding. That's, pay as you, that's just... Right. Yeah, reverse unfunded. To normal, reverse to the normal. Reverse to normal payments. Yeah. I got it. Okay. At which point we start funding up. Right. Well, with all due respect, I mean, I, I'm, in, I'm inclined to support what the retirement board supported in alternative schedule two. I appreciate the fact that the retirement board understood and heard us loud and clear that we wanted some extension of the funding schedule. That's, that's what we appreciate yeah, you yeah, pointing yeah, out the fact that we, you that we couldn't. That. Some people have recommended and suggested it would go beyond 31, which Eric likely would not support. And also the commitment in the letter that we got from Tom that um, You'll, uh, the retirement board will revisit this issue uh, upon the uh, valuation that will take place as of January 1st of 24. Next year, right. Exactly. Continuing with the market. Yep. Has, and I uh, do keep in mind what, what we're, there, this, this is a, a floor. There's nothing that prevents us from. I hope we're unanimous on this. I'm on two. Great if we do more. So this would be a motion to, because it's conditioned upon us approving the, the COLA increase under uh, Chapter well, 260. By the way, Mark, these numbers build in that COLA. I got that. Yeah. Right, right. So is it, a, is it a motion to increase the Kohler for retirees from three to five and also to approve the funding schedule under alternative two? Are we doing that? I think we're doing two separate motions. Yeah, it's not our call to accept the funding. Yeah, it's just you're making it contingent on them doing it. Okay, okay. Yeah, we can make it contingent. So, um, okay. So uh, a move to approve a one-time increase in COLA in fiscal year 2023 for retirees from 3% to 5% condition upon the <laughs> Option two, option two, as set forth by the retirement board. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. No, appreciate it. that. It's, yeah. it's because really, moving from 4.45 down to uh, 2.5 mm -hmm. is a big move, mm -hmm. a bigger move than going from 2.5 to yeah. zero. Yeah. <laughs> well, planning out to visit this in January of next year. Yeah, I was listening to your uh, discussion with the school, Leah Marie Mahoney. And yes. So, as a resident, I'm going to throw out an option that I'll... That yeah, I'll please do. Claflin Street parking lot is 65, 70% empty. Just get that tunnel built. That would... That's you know, a even at my age, I can walk from Claflin right. Street lot to the high school in eight minutes. Yeah, right. I've, I've done it. No, I think, I think we need to continue to encourage... Cycling, pedestrian walking, the tunnel would help that. The, the tunnel would be a game changer. But uh, we need to think about ways to reduce the burden on the uh, residents on the high school, clearly. I mean, we've always done a great job in leading that effort, but we haven't completely solved for it. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Floyd, appreciate uh, your support here. Thank you. And thank Tom and the rest of the retirement board for us. All right. All right, cool. All right, we have a number of um, one day liquor licenses. and. I think there's some conditions on, on, on the first church one, right? I don't know whether we'll be able to prove have, that. Have they right? fulfilled the conditions, the fire department? So why don't we move on the first yeah, one so first? They, they have secured it. Okay. Yeah. So are we able to move on the uh, first church one? Yep. We can move on all of them. Outstanding Chief DeStefano's concerns that he expressed to us? Yep. Okay. Yes. All right. Do I have, so this, we can roll through these quickly then. So I have a motion. Um, can, there's three. Is it three? There's three. Yep. Where's the third? Oh, there it is. C. There was a Does private want to one. Read these motions, or uh, is someone read them? Yes, just a minute. Did you see how you know Adam signs this? So I, well, I'm totally the opposite. Have you seen that? <laughs> okay, move to approve the one-day liquor <laughs> license request from the Foundation for Belmont Education for wine and malt only, for a spring fundraiser on 80s Prom at the Beach Street Center on Friday, May 5th, two, 2023, from 7:30 p.m. to 10 o'clock p.m. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Move to approve the one-day liquor license request from the First Church in Belmont Unitarian Universalist for wine and malt only for a fundraiser auction on Saturday, May 6, 2023, from 5.30 p.m. to 10 o'clock p.m., uh, and they've met the conditions. Yep. Do I have a second on that? Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move to approve the one-day liquor license request for wine and malt only from Joshua Gold for a private family event at the Beach Street Center on Saturday, May 13, 2023, from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock p.m., Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Just on the first motion here, uh, and this is a Belmont Education um, Foundation from Belmont Education. Uh, so FBE having this fundraiser, um, the chief has suggested that they hire a detail. Yes. So. Because of the number of people. Of going spending. to that? Yes, uh, I talked to him about it today. So they're working on get, making sure that all gets. Okay, but I mean, certainly we need to advertise. I mean, they have FBE hasn't had a fundraiser, I believe, in some time, correct? 
So this is somewhat of a fundraiser that um, we can all somewhat attend, perhaps. I what was the year for? for? 2019, I think. Yeah, that's right. Okay, there you go. We signed these before. Is this new? Well, I guess we're signing yeah, them. Yeah, we're doing them. We're implementing them. We're implementing what? Signing of the one days. Okay. I think do so, they usually stamp them. Um, okay, I sign them. There you go. So we have uh, next one is a one day um, agricultural wine permit. Yeah. Agricultural wine is permit. This, is this summer long? It looked like they were one of the vendors. House Beer Brewing LLC. To yes. Sell wine at the Belmont Farmer Market for the It's for the season. Yep. Okay. Uh, I don't think anyone's here from that, are they? It looked like there were rules about not having alcohol. Does this mean they're selling just we go. clothes? They're not. When I was looking at the rules for farmers markets that we had included in the packet, one of them just had said something about. Um, let's see if I can find it. This is for the entire season. Yes. Are you here for the big stuff? Okay. So I had no, no, no alcohol. General behavior: no alcohol, no illegal drugs. Not. I am not classing them in with this at all. But I just wanted to be sure. That yeah, I think violating. it's using while you're there. Not tasting and selling. Um, I had no questions, didn't they? They're you? selling it, but this is not a place to drink the wine. No, yeah. it's just, yeah. Okay. Okay. Move to grant an agricultural wine permit for the Housing Bear Brewing LLC to sell wine at the Belmont Farmers Market for the 2023 season. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, discussion possible to approve request from the Belmont Public Library to host the Tai Chi event at the Wellington Station Green Space. Saturday, this Saturday, April 29, 2023, from 10 to 12. Is there any concerns on this at all? Or? Nope, not the rains. Move to approve the request from the Belmont Public Library to host a Tai Chi event at the Wellington Station Green Space on Saturday, April 29, 2023, from 10 a.m. to noon. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Paul and Taylor, want to join us? Thank you for being patient and long suffering. This is your topic. Yeah, uh, and Paul, I have to say, able for this. Yes. Yeah, so, so let me back up and. Um, you want you want the chair? No, you get no, the no, chair. No, you're no, 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 no. There's <laughs> another chair over there. Oh no, I insist. I'll give you the courtesy. Another leather over there, if you oh, want it. Great. In the process of my select board campaign, I spent a lot of time, uh, particularly interested in economic development and challenges faced by small businesses. I learned a whole lot of things that were um, disconcerting that I hadn't known before, and without going into huge detail realized that we really needed to clean up our zoning bylaw, which was internally inconsistent and very unfriendly to businesses, and among other things, um, probably an over uh, reliance on special permits. And I started calling it the Frankenstein zoning bylaw because it just felt like thing had been piled upon thing upon thing, um, among other things, uh, precluding us from using the state of the art industry standard software for planning and zoning. Um, and apart from that, we all know that Belmont faces a fiscal crisis and with a 95-5 uh, residential commercial tax base, um, we can't tax our way out of this problem. Uh, we all know that we need an override, but even the override's not gonna solve this problem. And in the process of talking to a lot of people, spoke with both um, Taylor and Paul and realized what incredible talent they've convened on both the Economic Development Committee and the Vision 21 Implementation Committee. And in speaking with an architect, she said, well, we need to form a committee to rewrite the zoning bylaw. And I said, no, we don't. We've got 67 committees. The last thing that we need is another committee. And I think the staff will commit harikari if I tell them we're forming another committee that they've got to then monitor. So what can we repurpose? And the, um, the upshot of that was that Vision 21 and Economic Development said they would take on the task, at least initially, of looking at the zoning bylaw and figuring out things that we can do to be a uh, more forward-looking, business-friendly, and residential-friendly town. Uh, there seems to be very broad agreement on where we want to go, that MBTA communities is providing an impetus for us to go this direction anyway. Um, we've kind of got a, a short, a middle, and a long-term focus. Um, in the short run, I, I asked if we could come up some things for, for town meeting, special town meeting consider in the fall. Yes, they're substantive, yes, they're real, but it also would signal to the citizens of Belmont that we are planning for ways to reach um, a more secure financial footing that doesn't just rely on overrides. We need overrides, and I'm not sugarcoating that. 
but we also need to look at other ways to enhance our revenues. Um, and business development's the obvious way to do that. Um, in the, the mid run, we really do probably need to rewrite the zoning bylaw, but we do need some, frankly, some grants and some professional support to do that. Um, in the long run, we really need to look at a very long-term plan, 10, 15, 20 years out. What are things that we can do to really seriously address, um, whether it's business or uh, you know, re really business, maybe lab space, something. Anyway, short, medium, long. That's I'm setting I'm setting the table. And um, Paul, I I hadn't read through this until today, but but what you came up with was was really fabulous. Um, in particular, preemptively answered a lot of concerns that I already had. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is Taylor had come to me saying, hey, if there were three things that you'd want for town meeting in the fall, what would they be? And I said, well, I think, um, can we add hotels as a permissible use in Belmont? Because there was this proposal for a boutique hotel five years ago that everybody thought was such a great idea because it's room tax, it's property tax, it's meals tax, it's liquor tax. And the Zoning Board of Appeals decided that there was just no way that a hotel could be a permissible use anywhere in Belmont. So can we fix that? That's a really strong signal of where we want to go. Um, second, can we fix the restaurant problem, which I didn't know existed until I started looking at the restaurant problem, which is that restaurants really have to jump through so many hoops to open. And when you're a small business, you can't carry those costs with no end in sight for knowing when you're going to open. So can we fix the restaurant problem? And then finally, can we fix what I've heard is a sign problem? which is it's really expensive and difficult to comply with our signage requirements. And I- When you open up a new business. Yeah, mm -hmm. or even existing businesses. Apparently, yeah. um, I, I, a existing business owner came to me with a, a pretty sad story about what had happened on a signage when he didn't realize he was out of compliance. Mm -hmm. And um, so what can we do to make life easier for businesses in town and to signal to them that we really do care, we're open. And, and residents want this too. Residents don't like seeing empty storefronts in Belmont Center. Residents want services in town. We don't want to have to drive to other towns to get the things that we need. I think people would really like to see just a more vibrant Belmont. That is my very quick spiel. So I, I'll turn. Yeah, Jim, thank you for that. So Paul, you wrote this uh, Belmont zoning revamp exercise? It's a version one. The version one? No, I mean, I think it's really well done. It's, I read it, yeah. It's, Please introduce yourself both of So Paul Joy, I'm chair of the Economic Development Committee. Thanks for that, Elizabeth. Yeah. Uh, I'm Taylor Yates, chair of the Vision 21 Implementation Committee. And so I, I guess with, with this vision, with version one, Mark, I, I on the night of the election, you know, I sat down on the kitchen table and I'm like, okay, well, she's been talking about all these great ideas. Now, what are they actually going to be? And so I basically made the decision, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get some assistance from, and to be frank, ChatGPT did assist with the writing of this particular <laughs> ChatGPT version 4.0. I, I didn't write all of it. ChatGPT, yeah. Um, but I, but I gave, but I gave it a bunch of prompts. I gave it your op-ed. I gave it, you know, a, a number of different issues or ideas that have been floating around town for quite some time. And I asked it, what could we potentially do? And I challenged it. I asked it questions. Basically, this is what it was able to kind of come back with. And the basic idea is that, yes, we need to go move forward and have some type of a, a new zoning bylaw, but we have to do it in a way that is, you know, incremental. Mm -hmm. We have to start this fall. And so in thinking about that, what are the certain areas that we can identify where we can experiment um, with certain things, building heights, other types of codes, et cetera, to basically demonstrate, okay, this is this is this is a potential area of opportunity across town in the short term. Mm -hmm. So ChatGPT explains something, which is that I thought that you had taken someone else's plan in spot. So you're clearly quoting Just something. Asked, no. But actually, I mean, what they what Chat it, it pulled on some good stuff. I thought, oh, this makes, this makes entirely good sense. Mm -hmm. um, so it clearly had found someone else's plan. Um, which is fine. Why, no. why reinvent the wheel? Taylor? Right. Yeah. Um, so what I'm hoping to achieve tonight is a little bit more modest. Please identify yourself. Sorry? Please identify yourself. Oh, Taylor Yates, Chair of the Vision 21 Implementation Committee. Uh, what I'm hoping to achieve tonight is a little bit more modest. So um, we, I'm looking for a clear mandate for how Vision 21 can get us to the fall town meeting with some actionable things that we can put in front of town meeting. A little bit of backstory on that. So. Just before the pandemic, we had uh, basically gotten a master plan refresh project off the ground. And then understandably the pandemic hit, long-term planning like that went to the wayside. Uh, the grant money that we had acquired went away. The staffing that we had acquired went away. The committee we had formed went away. 
so we reconstituted as the pandemic wound down, wound down this fall and um, started looking for either making another attempt at the master plan, um, which we decided we couldn't do because of the issues I just outlined. And then we started looking more specifically at uh, zoning bylaws and realized that uh, a small group of lay people were probably not qualified to take on a comprehensive zoning bylaw project. Uh, so we felt that uh, we can go through though and identify some low hanging fruit specifically as it, uh, as it pertains to restaurants and hotels and signs, all the things that Elizabeth um, mentioned. And so I would love to be able to go back to, because we have pivoted a couple of times since we've reconstituted the committee, I would love to, go be, uh, to be able to go back to the committee and say, this is what the select board has charged us with doing. Um, and so that we can put something on, on the agenda in the fall. A little more context. Mark and I had met with Patrice before I was on the select board, so we were not violating open meeting law. <laughs> and I had raised this idea of using Vision 21 in conjunction with EDC. Uh, and Mark's opinion was that you could already do this, mm -hmm. but I do think there's value in you being able to go back to your committee saying the select board is fully behind you and this is the charge. So I, I agree. I agree with Mark that you could do it anyway, mm -hmm. but I think it helps we can sort of charge for us to yeah. put our improvements. I, I so, I'm sure Roy has some comments. Go ahead, Roy. Yeah. Um, so lots and lots of people in town uh, are concerned about zoning and uh, so how to organize something that's coherent is an interesting question because I know that there are many uh, very um, capable people now involved in Vision 21 uh, as a vehicle for a zoning project. Um, the housing production plan is a whole separate uh, activity with a lot of zoning components to it. The MBTA communities is a pretty big zoning project, which involves both residential and commercial because mixed use is a big, going to be a big part of that. Right. Uh, we, so we have these three groups that are going to have to work uh, um, cooperatively and in an informed way. In the meantime, we don't have a town planner. Mm -hmm. And the, the, there's one person in town really with the expertise now about current zoning issues, who we referred to earlier as being stupendously overloaded. So mm -hmm. uh, there's this question. I, I would <coughs> suggest that, um, <coughs> so let, let me just say what I, I think is a, a, a tangible start, a, a feasible starting point is to focus maybe on the core business areas and maybe focusing on Belmont Center. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm a little nervous, honestly, when I read Paul's memo because it's, it's taking on the entire town in one <laughs> big bite. Well, Chad GBT did that. Yeah. And <laughs> let, me, let me be specific. For example, referring to corridors that are I think are actually very complicated, like Trapello Road. Mm -hmm. If you start from the Waltham line and go all the way to Cambridge, there's a lot of issues that vary almost block by block, including, you know, in Cushing Square, there's already an overlay district. Yeah. And uh, the previous chair of the planning board made a, a, an off the record commitment to me that there would not be another development like Cushing Square, in Cushing Square, uh, anytime soon. Um, and we're, so there's just, there are so many potential moving parts to all this that I, I think it's really critical to identify things that are uh, discreet enough to be achievable in a fairly short time frame. And it would be helpful to maybe begin by identifying what are kind of the, the worst um, the deficiencies of the current uh, zoning bylaw in, in the commercial area, if we can identify them, you know, I mean, if it bears on restaurants or the permitting process for restaurants and new businesses generally, or just start with something that's not the entire zoning code, because that's a gigantic thing, uh, but start with discrete things that can be improved. And I, and I think that would also give people a basis of experience to then uh, 
and you know, branch out from there. Can I just interject? I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, which is why I said in, in the fall, give me three discrete things, restaurants, fix the restaurant problem, mm -hmm. um, which, which is a commercial area permitting problem. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, in fairness to Paul, you were kind of setting out a vision, but I thought you were very clear that this had to be incremental with input, that this was not at all I think it was an idea. It was it was well, a presentation idea. A roadmap and time to change things, right? I mean, we want to create opportunities for enhanced economic development and business opportunity within Belmont, and we're not there yet. We've heard from you've heard from I've heard from a lot of the landlords and businesses that Belmont, justified or not, has a reputation not being particularly business friendly. Paul, you and I have talked about this quite a bit. I think EDC has done great work in trying to to spell some of that, but I think there's changes that are necessary. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, but I think to Roy's point, all that we're being asked for tonight is this discrete charge to vision to Vic right. to bring these these items before. So, how would you special folks, town meeting? Folks call? that are watching, perhaps, and other mm -hmm. residents in town, um, perhaps don't want much to change. Mm -hmm. We do have to change in time. Mm -hmm. Mixed use development is in our future clearly in our town centers and like my, my children and whatever others that they prefer to live in a mixed use development center town live above storefronts like in Cambridge and we're not, we're not going to become in Cambridge but the point is that I think that is within Belmont's future it's not there today clearly how would you go about um, I think with sort of a charge from the, the board to, to start to address some of these issues in, in an incremental way whatever way you think fit how would you gather input from the community would you gather in part from the room, I guess? The yeah. Um, well, so part of how vision. I think you have so much to do that you just sort of drowning in it, but go ahead, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, so part of the way Vision uh, 21 is organized and charged is to engage the community. Um, and so I think the probably the place where I would start uh, is twofold. One is uh, the zoning bylaws itself, because they do say a number of things specifically about restaurants um, and even as lay people, we can identify things that like may or may not need further explanation or to be revisited, but also going to uh, restaurateurs themselves in Belmont and asking them like, what is what is or was the most difficult part of engaging with the yep. town? Good. Um, and I think if you come at it from those two directions. I think uh, to get to sort of starting point. build support for some of the changes, I, I would look at them as opportunities within our zoning bylaw to enhance economic development time is how I would phrase it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think starting off in that way, we're sort of in a, a charge to sort of look at that and then expand upon that and report back to the select board and terms of your feedback would be really helpful. So I do think, were you looking for something from us tonight? You did Before have that Before you do email. that though, there was one hand up. Um, oh, okay. Sort of admit yep. that normal, it, right? Yeah. It, would be, um, it would be very helpful. Uh, to be able to go to the next Vic meeting, which will probably occur within the next two weeks. I'm looking at your April 10th and, email. Can we just mm -hmm. can we just use your April 10th email? Sure. Before we do that, though, let me admit yeah. uh, Norma Maserati. Norma, how are you tonight? Long time not. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you. Just a, a couple of comments. And Norma, please, I just identify yourself. Yeah. Oh yes, sorry, Norma Maserati, town meeting member, precinct. Five um, and I think I understood most of this. Uh, just a couple of comments to offer my perspective. I agree with Roy. I think the scope here is too broad. Um, I also think that the SCIG group, the Structural Change Imp Impact Group, um, came forward with many recommendations. Yeah. If the driver here is about um, is economics. The SCIG came forward with many recommendations, which included some components of it included zoning and uh, monetizing town owned parcels, et cetera. So I'm not sure I'm in support of um, changing the scope of Vision 21 or broadening the scope of Vision 21 to include zoning um, when we haven't addressed or responded to many of the recommendations put forward by SCIG. So I recommend that people take a look at those recommendations, prioritize which ones to go after and drive some savings here through those ideas that came from many 
um, in our town. Thank you. Well, Norma, thanks for the input. And I think you know perhaps that um, there is a structural change impact group implementation committee. Is that what we're calling it? Yes. yes That's shared sure. by a former member that you were, uh, Paul Richter, and they've been meeting. And aren't they supposed to be appearing before us? To At some point, yeah. Yeah, they're working on a yeah. bunch of things. Well, as, as I said in our last meeting, I don't want Belmont to be the place where good ideas go to die. Like, no, and they, they are moving on that. I think it's so incremental. They're moving on and trying to prioritize in terms of which ideas are sort of. And, and that is not a common in a CIG. Is there, is there a member of the structural change impact group also on VIC? We actually have two. Okay. So. I think the problem is you're going to run up against the clock because mm -hmm. planning board needs to have a public hearing on, on any zoning change that you're going to put forward. So your mm -hmm. final language would have to be really done by early so to mid-September. Oh, yeah. we, oh, we, okay. Really so, to mid-September. Yeah, the okay. matter is, we, we, we had we started on this to see where we end up. Yeah. But I mean, I think the idea is about looking at sort of ways to... Well, am I... Norma makes a good point. Structural change impact group implementation committee. We don't want. We spent a fair amount of time. You know, a lot of folks were a lot of enormous number of ideas. Some of which, Phil, you may want to take a look at in terms of what's there. If you have mm -hmm. members on your committee, then they can. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know Adam Pickling is right. He's he's a member. Yep. But, but I think what we're talking about tonight are these three very specific requests. Yeah, go ahead. So go ahead and make a motion. And I think um, if I we're not talking about the big picture. I like go ahead the big and make picture, a motion tonight, on sort of yeah. enhanced uh, sort of charge. Let, let me just make a quick, a quick comment that um, I've spoken with both Jeff Berenbaum and Carol Berberian on the planning board, and they're very much in support of this as well. So I think the planning board is is interested right. in being a constructive partner in this process. And I I should add that. Um, I, I don't think that this has to be a comprehensive exercise. Um, I've already reviewed a lot of the zoning bylaws on my own and have identified there's some things that just like, it, it's not clear why there are restrictions in place that inhibit um, some of these business types. Um, you know, restaurants are allowed by right in only two of our business zones. It's not clear why they're not allowed in the other business zones. And restaurants of a certain side are not allowed by right in any of our business zones. Um, so those those are the kinds of things where uh, I don't think it needs to be a comprehensive exercise to have some meaningful conversations in the town and put something meaningful in front of the town meeting. As a note, this is kind of more of a question. I, I don't believe that all of the regulations that uh, apply to uh, opening a new business are specified in the zoning in the zoning bylaws. Is there other regulations? No, from my understanding that. The the, the, the way the zoning is currently written does make uh, cumbersome for some businesses to start up. And I think that this, these conversations have happened in economic development. I know Elizabeth and I have We've met with some of the landlords. Yeah, we met with some. I, I think that biting off a small piece, because any zoning that you put forward to town meeting is a two-third vote. That is a very high bar. And you're going to have people that probably remember why some of those things that you just listed were put in the zoning bylaw many years ago and maybe don't want to change it. So mm -hmm. I think that small pieces that you can define and, and explain why they will better uh, are better for the community, I think that that's only going to enhance the town. Yeah, and, and I think we've all made the same point that if we can gain trust on some of these small things, then there might be more trust in opening the process further yeah. down the road. So with that, uh, I'm going to... Uh, move that the select board declare that the following are, I'm going to say high priority work, not highest, but high priority work for the Vision 21 Implementation Committee. Zoning bylaws that are dubious value to the town and burdensome on restaurants. Zoning bylaws that are dubious value to the town and prohibit hotels as a permissible use. Zoning bylaws that are dubious value to the town and burdensome on businesses who hang signs. So that was a motion, right? That's the motion. Do I have a second on that? Could I add a friendly amendment? Yes. Go ahead. Or, or and more gen. Got to phrase this. Um, more generally, identify uh, existing zoning bylaws and regulations that are perceived as burdensome by uh, individuals seeking to open a business in Belmont. It's a nice add to that motion. I. I. That's great. Yeah. So do I have a second on the amended motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well, Taylor, I thank you very much for taking this up and your service on this vision and invitation committee and Paul as well, continued co-chair of the- uh, Chair. Yeah, let me just say- Oh, that's Kath Kath Kathleen. Oh, no. Step down. Yeah. Chair now. Chair. Chair, not co-chair. Chair. Go ahead. Yeah. The, uh, the advantage of shooting for town meeting is that it's always good to have a deadline, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
if it turns out not to be attainable, but uh, do we need to appoint members to your committee? You could report back here. Uh, you know, more than once between now and then, I think would also help keep you on track. Absolutely. In terms of the time, Patrice, so end of September, that's like the deadline. Mid September. Mid September. Final language. And we, and we also need to do public engagement, probably. Yeah, well, the planning board will, well, whatever you do in, right. on your end, but the planning board does have to, by law, have a public hearing. That's a two week notice. You know, we have to get the warrant posted, signed. I mean, there's a whole process and procedure to it. Can and it depends on when we have town meeting. That was the other thing. Um, um, sometimes we have it in early that. November, sometimes it's not until yeah, it's it. So we haven't settled on that yet. So the timeline is going to be dependent on when all town meeting. <laughs> it's also speaking with the moderator because generally, um, right now, we're identifying some articles on town meeting. <laughs> Excuse me. Paul, I don't know exactly what the moderator is going to, you know, want to see. Okay. Paul, do we need to appoint additional members to unite the balcony? Not tonight, but um, at some point you will. There'll be two appointees. Appointees, right? They're both. I, I will make recommendations. Uh, Emma, right. Um, and, and to Taylor's point, I mean, in terms of in terms of the importance of this work, it actually helps us to attract members. Oh yeah. Yeah, great. Because they want to be part of something that is going to be impactful. Thank you both. Appreciate you coming tonight. It's a rather late hour here. So, uh, any liaison reports? Yeah. We're a streamlined liaison <laughs> structure in there. Yeah. What? We're, we're, we have a streamlined. We're adding more liaison. At, at, at 10, 10 p.m., we're feeling I think there was a boys intent to, to shorten the meetings. Well, we're, yeah, we're shorten and here, here we I'm are. Shorten it by much. That's a short. All right, we have a series of minutes to approve. Uh, there are three, Elizabeth, that you cannot participate in. I don't know whether you abstain or not vote at all. I think abstain. I'm I'm so do I have a, a motion? Um, um, which ones did you amend? I circulate? The one, one just had a spelling mistake for Chief McIsaac's name. The other one. Which one was that one? August 7th? They were extremely minor changes. I did vote. No, let's do the first three first. Did you have changes on the March 20th, April 3rd, and April 3rd? I don't think so. You're testing me, Mark. <laughs> well, that's what's in my packet. I read them. No, what, uh, what, let me just check whatever I emailed this morning. Let me, you let me email the 7th and the 10th. Okay. So then everything else is fine in my book. So do I have a motion to approve the March 2023 regular session, the April 3rd, 2023 regular session, and the April 3rd, 2023 executive session? Uh, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstention? Abstain. Okay. Uh, then uh, Roy sent along. Did you see them, Elizabeth? Um, Amended yes. uh, minutes for the April yes. 7th and April 10th. They were extremely minor changes, essentially clerical, and I. <coughs> so there were motion to amend. So the... I, I move approval of the April 7th, 2023 minutes. As amended. As amended, the April 10th, 2023 minutes as amended. And in the April, April 11th, 2023 20... 20, minutes. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, with that, uh, our next meeting um, is. Um, Monday, May 1st, before town meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, here they are here. Sorry, I had to turn the page. We have a 5.30 p.m. pre-ATM meeting, hybrid. It's going to be hybrid? Yes, we're going to have um, a TV in your room so people can remote in. Uh, we need to know where that, where we're meeting. It's going to be in the media center. That's yeah, second no floor, library. Right. We'll just get there. I'll get there early. Get there early. Can we yeah. park in the parking lot or is that going to yeah, be closed? Yeah, park in the lot. Right. Um, on May 1st, on Monday, uh, on May 3rd, uh, I guess we'll need all of these meetings, correct? Uh, we might not meet, need the 8th. We'll have to see. And then the third meeting on May 8th, pre-ATM at 5.30. And then on Wednesday, May 10th, to reiterate, we have a water and sewer very public hearing from 6 to 7. Um, this is suggesting hybrid. We'll have to, we'll have to determine. We'll just, that. Again, we'll the option. Yeah. And we're back to a regular meeting on May 22nd, 2023. So with that, sorry, I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.